Hello. 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 Hello, Sanjay. How are you? Nice to see you, sir. How are you? Getting on, getting on. Okay. Age is catching up. You, you you look good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went recently to AUA uh, last week and I gave a talk. And the topic of the talk was, if we all follow guidelines, then who will invent? That's true. That's a very good point. Yeah. First of all, guidelines is only guidelines. It's only guiding. Yeah. It's not to be implemented. Strictly. Correct, correct. Yeah. Hello. 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 Raman, how are you? Sir, very good morning. I am fine. Good morning, Vino, sir. How are you? Good. All good, sir. So, very apt topic, sir, for the apt person to talk about. Hello, Sajada. I haven't met you for a long time. Good morning, sir. How are you? Hi, on. I'm, on, I'm on leave. I was in uh, Kolhapur. So I'll be joining on the mobile. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sajada. Yeah, nice keeping good, Sujata. Health, good health. Dr. Sujata? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Rupin is preparing the case. If we can quickly uh, go with the proceedings of inaugural ceremony. Of course, is Dr. Sir, Lakshman of course. Joined? Dr. Lakshman has joined? Uh, no, sir. I can't see yes, him. Yes, yes. Who has joined? Yeah, you, you can see me now. Ah, now oh. I can. Hi, Lakshman. Hello, Good morning, sir. sir. Good morning. Okay, then um, Dr. Shata, you can go ahead with the... Uh, uh, this uh, inaugural ceremony proceedings and uh, once you are done with the whole and then we'll uh, hand over to Dr. Rupin for the case introduction and the plan. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So we can go ahead, sir. Another two minutes are there for 11 o'clock. We'll wait. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, once 11 o'clock, you can go ahead. Okay. 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 Sir. okay. Yeah. 
almost paranoid for infection uh, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to the first uh, webcast from the indian school of urology under the urological society of india and we are happy to have so many participants and uh, today's workshop is on andrology and i request our president um, dr sanjay kulkarni who himself is a uh, very um, renowned uh, reconstructive surgeon and uh, we uh, i request him to give the opening remarks uh, for this inauguration ceremony thank thank you sujata uh, i am happy that professor venu gopal has joined us in the morning uh, we are very happy that he is taking still taking part in our proceedings uh, so uh indian school of urology this is the first workshop and the none other than my favorite uh, dr rupin shah uh, is is uh, going to conduct this workshop on penile processes so we are grateful to rupin shah for um, first of all inventing the shah penile processes which we use regularly and we tell around the world that this is an indian invention and Uh, rupin shah uh, is responsible for inventing this uh, very re reasonably priced and fantastic device called rupin uh, the shah's penile processes um, uh, and uh, today we are going to watch him do live surgery uh, so uh, i welcome everyone uh, and we will request dr lakshman to say a few words our honorary secretary of royal society of india lakshman please yeah thank you sir thank you for your uh, opening remarks and now i request our uh, secretary dr lakshman prabhu to please give the secretarial uh, address thank you very much madam uh, respected professor teacher of teacher uh, dr venu gopal who has logged in i am extremely happy that he is watching those same very theaters which he had very affectionately nurtured and uh, brought into existence president kulkarni uh, chairman indian school of urology dr chavla madam sujata and esteemed faculty dr rupin shah it uh, uh, gives me great happiness immense happiness to find that my alma mater is organizing the first ever webcast of uh, the indian school of urology this year and we are at a time when we find that operative andrology is shrinking gone are the days when we used to have testicular biopsies varicocelectomies allospatic spermatocele vasovasectomy vasoepidomastomy so many procedures which are now uh, done infrequently and uh, at a time when uh, we find that the operative component of andrology is shrinking this workshop is of uh, great importance because today we are going to see one in the domain of erectile dysfunction that is insertion of the penile processes by none other than Uh, dr rupin shah a renowned andrologist a pioneer in the field and we are all fans uh, we have been watching him since our training day 
and the, you know, more than anything else, she's one amongst our own. So one among that gives us a lot of joy to you know see watch him uh, deploying a penile processes. And this is in the area of erectile function dysfunction, and then also the surgical retrieval of the sperm because when the ICSI was invented, we thought that it is. Uh, uh, closure of the shops for the urologists or the andrologists, but the andrologist still has a role in the retrieval of the sperm. And I'm extremely happy that the Indian School of Urology is bringing this webcast live to the not only to the sectional members but to the general, uh, the primary member of the Urological Society of India. With these words, I once again thank the Indian School for the excellent work which they are doing, and I'm happy that all those who have logged in and those who are physically present there. We'll have a great time learning from the master. Thank you very much, Madam Patwardhan. Over to you for the conduct of today's webcast. Yes, sir. I would like to also welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Anand Venugopal. And uh, here I would like to mention that he is our teacher's son. Uh, and he is in charge of the teaching uh, um, of, uh, of the entire Manipal Hospital teaching session. And he is the CEO. So welcome, Dr. Anand. I would also like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Avina Shetty, who is the uh, medical superintendent of uh, Manipal Hospitals. So I would uh, request Dr. Avina Shetty uh, uh, to please uh, say a few words. Uh, uh, Good morning, everyone. Dr. Chawla, sir. Dr. Avina Shetty is there. Yeah, he's there. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, everyone. So I'm happy to be part of uh, this uh, program. And uh, uh, my uh, no, sincere um, uh, thanks to all the people who are involved in organizing this program. Also, I like to extend uh, warm greetings on the behalf of Kasuba Hospital to all the delegates, uh, the guest speak, I mean, the guest faculty, and all those who are attending uh, this particular uh, program. Uh, this year, actually, we are uh, Kasuba Hospital celebrating the 60th year. And uh, just want to say that, you know, urology department is one of the earliest uh, super specialist department to be started uh, in uh, Kasurba Hospital. And uh, Venugopal sir uh, was the pioneer behind uh, this department. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, they've been doing uh, a wonderful uh, job for uh, so many years and also conducting many such uh, live surgical workshops, uh, CMEs. Uh, thank you and uh, wish you all the best. Uh, Chawla sir, is Dr. Uh, Anant Venugopal uh, available to say a few words? Good morning. Uh, Good morning. All, uh, I thank uh, Chawla and team for having me and Avinash here. And uh, best wishes to the entire team from Dr. Chawla to Lakshman and the entire team for organizing and conducting this live workshop with one of the pioneers in the field on pandrology right here. I'm sure that the conference and the live workshop will be well appreciated by everyone who's logged in and uh, once again from Kasturba Hospital and Manipal Group a very warm wishes to the entire team. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you Dr. Anand and then we have one more of our family, our own uh, Dr. Padma Raj Hekde who is our, uh, who, who is the professor of urology but now he is in a different role as the dean of uh, um, Kasturba Hospital Manipal. And uh, I, I request you, sir, to please put a few remarks about this session, and then we can hand over the mic to uh, Chawla, sir. Good morning, madam. Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni, the president of USI. Dr. G.G. Lakshman Prabhu, honorary secretary USI. Dr. Arun Chawla, chairman ISU. Dr. Sujata Patwadhan, chairman elect ISU, the moderators, and all my urology friends. As a urologist, I'm honored to be a part of this workshop. The field of andrology is con constantly evolving and this workshop offers us an opportunity to share knowledge and learn from the expert in andrology, Dr. Rupin Shah. I encourage all the postgraduate registrars in urology to take the full advantage of this workshop and participate by taking part in the discussions. I'm happy to inaugurate this workshop and wish you all a great learning. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being actually part of this inauguration ceremony. I thank our president, our secretary, Dr. Anand, Dr. Avinash, and uh, Dr. Hegde, sir. And now we hand over the mic to Dr. Arun Chawla, sir, to introduce Dr. Rupin Shah and to uh, start the operative workshop. Uh, Dr. Yatha, good morning. Uh, I think Dr. Rupin is uh, scrubbed up for the case and he wants to share the detail about the patient preparation and all that. I'll straight away take you to the OT and meanwhile, once a little time is there, um, I'll formally introduce to the uh, all the delegates who have logged in. Okay, I'll, I'll just connect the uh, audio to him now. Okay, sir. Ah, but that for me is fine. Like towel. Oh, ah, that's chlorhexidine. So on one gauze, we'll take chlorhexidine, swap the area, and then put the plastic sheet. So something to dry. Thank you. Yeah. The antiseptic works better after your skin is dry. So first step should be to dry the skin. And then, okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Can someone confirm that I'm audible and clear? Audible, audible. Audible, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm talking again. Can you please confirm that I'm audible? And clear? Can you take uh, that on a gauze? Uh, audible, sir. Please. Apply it here. Hi, am I audible? I'm testing again. Nice and clear. Yes, so, uh, good morning, yes, everyone. Today, the goal is to kind of teach implantation. There have been many workshops. Uh, we'll have to turn off the sound there, otherwise there's an echo. Sister Gloves, please, seven number. An echo. We have to take care of the echo. Let us stay. What's the director? Stick one gauze in your hand. Yeah. What is that? This solution? Okay. Fine. Sure. Thanks to me. And do you also have powder free gloves? So when we are handling the implant, we'll use powder free. Okay, plastic sheet, please. Yeah. And second gown on that. Yeah. Fine. Perfect. Okay. Put a plastic drape now. Yeah. And the gown for me. What has happened? It's got contempt now, but it came out, came loose. You can't advance it now. I'll leave it there. You can't go from unsterile to sterile. It opened out. Ah, actually, no, we'll use the surgery right away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, afterwards, whoever catheterizes will need gloves, not me. Somebody, surgery wear drape, please. So am I, are we on? Okay. Yes, sir, you are audible. Oh, I'm audible, but am I yes, visible? Uh, okay, no, so... we are seeing the patient, uh, patient genital being scrubbed up. And uh, also we are seeing the patient details on the screen. The... Okay, hi, Sujata, nice to hear from you. Uh, yes, sir, thanks, same here, sir. The goal today is to try and teach the implant. So I'm not going to do a fast, quick implant. Instead, we have two surgeons who have not 
done in plants before. We have Dr. Surag and Dr. Aman, right? Aman. Uh, both of whom have assisted previously but never operated. So I'm going to be assisting them. And the idea will be to try and highlight these subtle points of implantation. So, for example, um, we're just waiting to see this draping happen. Okay, usually, I just use a simple 40 rupee uh, surgery wear plastic. This is a fancy drape. So, okay, we'll need Shame something to cover the legs. Be careful, don't touch them. So everything has to be obsessive about avoiding infection. So for example, I've washed my spectacles with a antiseptic solution. That's too pathetic. Do we have something nice and proper to cover the legs with? Something big and heavy, this will fly away. And uh, each person after they've scrubbed up has taken sterilium on their hands. After the sterilium, then they've been gloved with full precautions. Uh, now we have applied betadine, two coats, waited for it to dry. And now, can we have the light here, please? So one of the areas of contamination is when you catheterize the patient. Already we have pulled back the prepuce, cleaned inside. And recent studies have shown that the infection rate is lower when instead of betadine, you use uh, alcohol with, uh, where is the bottle? Not sterilium, the other one. Chlorhexidine, chlorhexidine with alcohol. So anyway, if you can see it on the camera, otherwise, we've just opened a bottle of chlorhexidine. Take it on a gauze piece, please. And the final prep, one gauze sister. Take some of the solution on that. The final skin prep will be with chlorhexidine. Can we have a screen here to isolate or at least cover the hands because an unsterile area is potentially touching your back. So you need to be obsess about these things because eventually doing an implant is technically quite easy. It's the infection. So for example, here the arms of the patient are still not covered with a sterile drape. Ideally, I would prefer a big screen here that completely isolates the anesthesia side. But if not that, then at least two drapes. What do we have? This is a screen. Yeah, but, but be careful, sister. Don't touch there. That is unsterile zone. Okay, yeah. Let's open it up and keep it here. And can we tape that there so that we have some more protection? So now we're using the ibutane to again swab it because studies have suggested that that results in a lower infection rate. Similarly, because this patient is diabetic, in addition to a second generation cephalosporin, we have used something specific for uh, resistant staph. So we've used Targosid 400 mg. And also recent studies have shown that 15% of infections are fungal. Therefore, we're also giving a fluconazole drip. You can either give it as a drip or the previous evening we could have given a tablet. Now comes the catheterization. Can we have a 2 ml syringe with betadine in it? Now, when we catheterize, there are bacteria in the anterior urethra, and we don't want the bacteria from the anterior urethra to contaminate our field. We're going to do two things. First, we're going to wash the anterior urethra with betadine and leave the betadine in place for a minute. Second, when we catheterize, we are not going to inject 10 ml of jelly in the urethra because when that flows back, it will again cause a regurge of bacteria onto our field. So instead, we'll lubricate the catheter generously, but we won't inject jelly. And then when we pull out the catheter, we'll keep a betadine gauze there and swap the catheter with it so that... So keep a mop here, please, so any spillover doesn't contaminate our field. So now we are injecting some... Yeah, keep one mop and one more mop. We'll inject some betadine. And this syringe we want to discard. Where can we discard it? Bucket. Okay, don't touch the nozzle. Yeah. So we've got not too much betadine. Don't want to irritate the urethra, but just enough so that the anterior urethra 
hopefully will be less. Now we don't need the bag, we just need the cap from the bag. The cap we are going to use on the catheter. So take out the cap, take the Foley catheter, please. And lubricate the entire catheter with jelly. And you can pull out the catheter, your gloves are sterile. One of you do it, so both of you don't contaminate your gloves, you can do it. Take the jelly on your glove and lubricate the whole catheter with the jelly. Yeah. Connect the 5 ml syringe there, not the bag, just the cap of the bag there. Connect the cap to the catheter so it doesn't leak out and 5 ml syringe to inflate the bulb. So the whole catheter is nicely lubricated, but without excessive jelly so that it will not regurge out. And then we want a gauze piece dipped in betadine, keep it ready. We're going to use lots of betadine. So keep your bowl filled with betadine. Okay, and then both of us are going to wear a second pair of gloves again. So sister gloves, seven number for both of us. Let's open the betadine and give it to me. Open it, open the gauze. Yeah, drop it in my hand. So that's going to be our line of defense. Okay, now we can catheterize. You can take the syringe and inflate once we are in. Saline. Saline. Huh. He's a young boy, so 4 ml should be enough for the bulb. A very large bulb only irritates the trigon and makes them uncomfortable. Now, once we are in, We will inflate the bulb. Give the syringe, please. Inflate the bulb. Uh, Sujata, are you there? Uh, yes, sir, I'm there. So every okay. once in a while, I just say yippee, so I know you're there. Okay, now, <laughs> okay, important sir. point. Leave that, please. So now what happens is as you pull out the catheter, again, it's going to pull out anterior, anterior bacteria in our field. We're going to do this betadine swab here. And as we pull out the catheter, the catheter is getting swabbed and we are going to leave this here. So any jelly oozing out will encounter betadine. Okay, so these are all stupid precautions to help minimize the risk of infection. And you guys feel free to ask queries on behalf of the audience, any query that you have. So we're just squeezing the betadine here. You can start wearing gloves because your gloves may be. So what you do is give, pour betadine on his hands, please. So we keep on creating multiple barriers. He took sterilium on his hands, then he wore gloves. Now he's going to wear a second glove, so he's going to smear betadine on his gloves. So that becomes a third barrier and give him the gloves now, and then he'll wear the gloves. And the gloves should be worn while the betadine is wet, then it'll slide in easily. And all these I've learned over the years, like putting betadine in the gloves, I saw 25 years ago with CB Dabuala, operating in Detroit when he was doing his implant. That time the nurse fired me because I stood in front of their wall mounted uh, air purifier unit. But all these people whom I've seen over the years have been equally obsessive. So now we will discard this and hopefully we have not got any contamination because of the betadine. I will need new gloves please for me to and again, take one swab of the uh, spirit solution, not spirit with, I keep on forgetting, chlorhexidine and spirit and keep it ready here to swab the area. Betadine on my gloves. Little betadine. And new gloves ready for me. Okay. So we form one more layer. And gloves seven. Profil afters, now you can give with powder. Afters, when we handle the implant, we will all change our gloves and then we will wear powder free because we don't want powder contaminating the implant. What is the cautery setting? Forty. Please make it about 10 to 15. Okay, so now we are ready. 
So you could take a vertical incision or a horizontal incision. You can see the penoscrotal junction here is fairly high. A vertical incision would also work. My only problem with a vertical incision is that sometimes while stretching, it tears onto the penis and the thin penile skin sometimes doesn't heal well. Therefore, I take a transverse incision. However, recently I had a patient who's claiming that post the transverse incision, he has numbness in this part of the penis. So we'll still do the transverse, but I'm going to ask all my patients if, that, if they're finding numbness and if they say yes, there is numbness, I might change to a vertical incision. But today we'll do what I'm familiar with. So Surag is going Good. to operate 15 number blade, please. Keep a wet. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Vineet here. Are you Vineet? Why aren't you here assisting? <laughs> uh, sir, couple of questions now that uh, we're starting with the procedure. Uh, what has been your planning for the procedure? What was your final step to decide that you needed an implant? We saw his history and what is the stretched penile length of the patient? What have you planned for him? So the final clinical history, etc. you know more than me. The stretched penile length, sister, you have a scale, please. It'll probably be 11 judging by what it is. But we will come to that again as we do the three critical measurements. But since Vinit has asked for it, you dig the scale up to the symphysis. So if they're fat, you have to dig through the fat because the hinging will happen at the level of the symphysis. So stretch the penis, make sure the skin is not pulling it down again. And then when I'm stretching to mid glands, I'm measuring about 12 centimeters. So if from the symphysis where it is going to hinge up to mid glands is 12 centimeters, you could use either WH11 or WH13 I tend to use the lower model number. So I'll probably use WH11. And what is WH level and why that? As we take the implant, we'll discuss that further. But I'm happy that Vineet is there because Vineet knows all the tricks of the trade. So if I forget anything, he'll make sure that that point is also discussed. Uh, sir, Who else? in the history... We have Vineet sir, Raman also, wonderful. We have an excellent panel who will make sure that every point is highlighted. We have Sujata whose video on the penile implant features in the video journal of urology. We have Raman, we have Vineet who's very, very experienced. So Vineet, Raman, Sujata, have any of you had patients complaining of hyposthesia of the undersurface of the penis after a transfer sensation? Wet gauze. All gauze pieces should be no. dipped in no, uh, saline no, gentamicin. No, sir, I also haven't had and I always use this uh, transfer incision only. Somehow mm -hmm. I like I had one patient recently who was quite unhappy with the whole thing. So now we're not going to use any retractor. It's possible to get away with a small incision, but when you're not using retractors and especially with the shy implant, we want the corporatomy to be deep. So the width of the incision will be wide enough for me to encircle the shaft later on and pull it out like that. So keeping that in mind, Surag is now going to place the incision and he's going to be assisted by Aman who will help him go through the skin and the cremaster till we reach the corpora. So I'm stretching the skin, making sure that the raffe is over the catheter. And we want the incision to be not too low, but not on the penile skin either. So you should be careful not to pull the scrotum onto the penis Otherwise, the incision will be too anterior. Rather, I'm pulling the scrotum down, then stretching the penile skin and now lifting the scrotum. So you can see very nicely that when he cuts from here to here, we'll be right in corpora. So you need a fine forceps in your hand. You need a mosquito. Go ahead, start. You need a wet gauze. Yeah, go ahead from there to there. You have to help him. So mop wet gauze, mosquito, forceps, cautery. Make it wide enough to go through the corpora. Since I never close the incision, I don't mind it being a little longer than somebody else is working at closing it. The, the history mentioned a plaque, uh, though it didn't comment about curvature. Would your I can't presence see any plaque now. Go ahead, continue to deepen and then uh, pick up between two mosquitoes, lift it up and cut. Give a forceps, Would take a mosquito, sam sam nipakura, hold opposite, yeah. Hold the other end so that he doesn't open the urethra. 
Yeah. So would the presence of a plaque change your incision? Um, if it was a curved penis where I expected that I needed to work on the plaque, then I would take a circumcising or a circumcoronal incision because then you have much better access to the plaque. If I feel that I'm not going to do anything specific to the plaque, then the incision remains the same. But like if it's a case of peronies where you need to go ahead, People are watching you guys, you have to impress them, cut nicely, smoothly, quickly, but don't open the urethra. But if you have to work on the plaque, like in the Peri, uh, Peronis conference, which we'll be having in June, there we will be discussing the approach and there certainly a circumcising incision would be much better because you can access the whole dorsum very easily. Continue going deeper, feel the catheter so you know where it is. Yeah, help him, help him, he's going under hold. Hold with the forceps, hold the opposite end, stretch. Let him hold closer to the, yeah. Yeah. Make sure mm -hmm. don't okay, I'm moving up so you have room now. Yeah, hold it. Yeah, stretch and cut. You have to be careful here as you cut that you don't damage the urethra. But layer by layer, you need to open the cremastric layers. And later on, we want to close. And ideally, at least one, possibly two layers of cremaster should be closed so that the tunical incision is completely protected from the skin. Sister, stay sutures are ready. Two zero black silk. Uh, two zero black silk. And in a kidney trick, keep the dilators ready. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Keep everything ready so we don't have to wait. Yeah. And we'll need 11 number stab knife. So in terms of the antibiotics, just to repeat, he's received a second generation cephalosporin. He's received a targosid and uh, also an antifungal. He will continue to receive the IV antibiotics today and tomorrow while he's in hospital. And then he'll go home on oral antibiotics for five days. Many people are not as aggressive. I've seen centers abroad which give antibiotics only for one day, hold closer to where you're cutting, yeah. Uh, Vineet, Raman, Sujata, if you all have any different antibiotic protocol, please pipe in and certainly feel free to add to the commentary or the discussion. So the tendency now, my practice is to use vancomycin, uh preoperatively and postoperatively till the next morning. And, okay, so uh, targets vancomycin, same thing, but vancomycin has this rare complication, uh, which can be very, very severe. Uh, what is it called? What is the major complication of vancomycin? Some black something. So the red Not man you, syndrome, actually. Yeah, yeah, red. Something major, which can happen rarely. So abroad, they use vancomycin, I think, for cost reasons. Here, because the cost is more affordable, I prefer to use Targosid. And if it's a clean case, non-diabetic, low risk, then I don't go that high. Then I use a simple single first generation cephalosporin and gentamicin 240 in the drip. If it's a high risk for infection and high risk would be diabetic, would be a redo case, or would be an expected difficult case, which will take a long time, then I move to the second level of antibiotics. Help him, help him quickly uh, hold it. I, and what is your Just preference of right irrigation? Of retractors ready? Sorry, I missed the question. So what is your preference for irrigation antibiotic? Uh, we are using saline with gentamicin in it. At one stage I used chloro because it's never used otherwise. So you can see now we are seeing the white tunica you're feeling the catheter here. There's one last layer left. Just a right angle retractor is ready. So, yeah. Find that plane, yeah. That plane on the tunica and dissect that same plane across the urethra to the other side. Now from there, from there, from where you've already got it. Yeah. And then let him cut there. Once I was doing a demonstration in Qatar, and I open the urethra accidentally at this stage. So then I close the urethra and finish the implant, which you could do because the urethra was opened directly, not from the corpus. 
Then the patient had a suprapubic diversion for two weeks and he recovered uneventfully. So now they're right on the corpora. Is the image clear? Can you see the white tulka? Yes, sir. The images right. are very good. So now, if you just see what they've reached, you can see here is the urethra in the center. And on either side is the tunica. The incision is a little small. I think we'll have to extend it. But see, I put my fingers in. I'm encircling the shaft and pulling it out. So it's just about enough, the incision. It'll probably tear a little on its own as we retract. So that's OK. Right angle retractors. Now. You have to put the retractor down. One, one minute. One common mistake that people make at this stage is that you pull the penis out from here. You shouldn't do that because your incision will be too anterior. Instead, the focus should be on pulling the penis out of the scrotum. So I'm encircling it above and we're pulling down. These are baby retractors. We want broader retractors. So yeah, put the broader retractor and Pull that plane down, yeah, and one here. So that now our corporotomy can go deeper down. So we, if you just do a blunt dissection here, you can see we've gone down. So this is where it's curving in. So rather than make the corporotomy here, we would like to make the corporotomy somewhere here. So that when you put the implant, the flexion of the implant is at the site of the corporatomy. Mosquito, please. Stay suture. So right now we're getting ready for the next step. However, there is still a layer of box fascia on it. So you can see this is the spongiosum. You can feel the catheter. Here is a white corpus. And now I'm splitting the box fascia. Now you can see the truly white. So take a cautery, get ready to cut. Yeah, cut between... That's the box fascia being divided. Now you see the white tunica albuginia. That is where we want to place our stay sutures and do the surgery. With a forceps, just hold this one edge so you can cut a little deeper because later on, otherwise this tissue will cover your incision and you'll have difficulty. Yeah, cut in the center, difficulty accessing the tunica. Okay, stay suture, sister. So now we want the incision to be placed about seven to eight millimeters away from the urethra. One mistake sometimes the new surgeon makes is the incision is too close to the urethra. The tunica retracts and then while closing, he finds it difficult to find an edge. So now take the stay suture, keeping in mind that our incision is going to be here. You want one stay suture here and one stay suture here. It should not go too lateral because if it goes dorsal, it will trap the neurovascular bundle. If it's too medial, you'll be too close to the urethra. So this is where I want the incision. Now place parallel, not horizontal, but perfectly parallel to the urethra. Keep deep bite in and then come out. Nice big bite. Okay, sister, lovely needle. Mosquito, please. Hold the suture with a mosquito. Yeah, not too long, not too long. Yeah, shorter, because there's just a stay suture. This length is enough. You should be able to finish four stay sutures. Cut, please, from this. Now keep on holding the stay suture. Keep in mind that this is where my incision is. Just keep a little bit of space and place the next suture on it. Sister, stab knife ready, suction ready. I don't see suction. Ah, suction is there. So keep 11 number blade ready, suction ready. A steely scissors and the dilators. Keep the dilators here now. You can leave that. Keep the dilators. Bring the dilators 9, 10, 11, 12. Keep them in the kidney tray with gentamicin solution. Yeah. Keep all the dilators. Mosquito, please, to him. Yeah. Put the mosquito and then another scissors and cut. Scissors. Yeah. Scissors cut, please. Now give him a stab, take the needle, give him a stab knife, give me a steely and keep the dilators ready. Okay, so now steely please. Steely scissors. 
Yeah. So now hold up the two stay sutures, lift them up. Okay, Sujata seeing clearly, sister hold the retractor. So this is where we're going to make the incision going through. So take the stab knife and cut about one centimeter between the two. Now this is a wide corpus. We expect that we'll be able to dial it to the maximum. Lift upwards, lift up, yeah, and cut between the two. So when he enters inside, there'll be bleeding and you'll see the spongy cavernosal tissue. One more. Yeah, little more this side distally, fine. Now, what we want to do is find the plane of dissection. So I'm under the tunica, but you can see me lifting it. Remove the mop. Yeah, you can see me actually lifting the tunica so that we are preserving some of the cavernosal tissue separating the tunica from the cavernosal tissue. Notice that the direction is more or less vertical. It's not like that. I'm going in and opening a little, allowing the tunica to guide me until I hit the bone and I open and come out. Similarly, we'll go in this plane. So take the scissors, enter the apex. Yeah, no, this will come in the way. So pull it like that. Yeah, enter, yeah. Yeah, lift up the tunica so you see the blades and open partially. Do not enter the urethra. Open a little, open, open. Open wider and come out and go in once more. Okay, that's enough. So he's created enough plane for the dilators to go. Open it and come out. Give the dilator sister 910. Come out, come out. 910. No, that's too small. Keep that away. Keep it away. Look at the next one. That looks like seven, eight. Look at the next one. Yeah. So this probably is a nine. Yeah. No, this is a 10 and 11. Okay, so we'll can probably try the 10. Retract, please. So what we do is we enter the space that we created with the scissors. Now, this is how the crura lie. So that's how the dilator should go. So it's going in this direction and a gentle movement, allow it to find its way. Sometimes you may have to use force, but otherwise it's just with my fingers, slowly rocking it till you can feel the impact. So go in with this, touch it, go, you feel the bone. That's how far we have to go. Now take it out and flip to 10. No, no, down, you're going this way. We're doing proximal with number 10. Again, watch the direction. Feel it as it's going. Yeah. If you see the curve, and there should be counter tension. If you don't give counter tension, relax, leave it. Don't give counter tension. When you move, the penis will telescope in. You will think you're hitting the bone, but you're not. So you have to pull like this and against that dilate. Next dilator, please. Now you can see. The opening is already a little tight. So we'll have to extend the opening a little. Give the 11 number blade, please. And cut on the center of the dilator to extend the corporatomy. Hold the retractor, hold the retractor. You can see right in the center, extend the corporatomy. Sister, pull out the next dilator, number 11, parallel to the urethra, a little more. So the dilator can go in freely. Eventually, we'll have to make it larger. In the beginning, we don't make it too large because if it's too large, yeah. Yeah, so now this is 11 and 12. These are really heavy dilators. They'll probably go in on their own weight. So again, the same direction. Go ahead, put it in. Hitting bone. Okay, do we have any sizer with us? No, we don't have a sizer. So do you have, a, I will need the ruler then. Okay, so 11 has gone in, it's fairly snug, but I think 12 will also go in. Yeah, do you have a larger one? And this is what size? 14, 15. Mm -hmm. I don't know, 15, it looks, take it out please. Okay, now we want to measure the length. So keep your finger at the center of the dilator Pull it out and against the scale, measure the length. Yeah, pull it out. Scale, put the scale, measure the length. Remember that this has a gentle curve. So whatever you measure, 
you have to add a little to it. Ideally, we should have a sizer which has markings on it. There is a sizer? Yes, sir. Where? For some reason, the sizer was kept hidden somewhere. Show us what is with sizer. What have you measured? Is measured 8.5. Probably it will be 9 or 10, but right now we'll keep it as 8.5. But magically they found a sizer. So let's see what we have. Show, show me what you have. Okay, this is the surgical sizer. Okay. Yeah, open it. So the advantage of that is it is straight and it has markings on it. So look at the markings. Can you see the markings? Yeah, but is the number? Yeah. So you can see it's going from one up to 10. So keep your finger on 10 and put it in. And put, yeah, put it in and read directly. Yeah. So put it in so that you can see the readings. Make sure it's gone in all the way. Are you hitting bone? One sec, let me see. Yeah, now take a reading directly. You can read off the marking. Can you see the marking? Nine. Okay, so it matches. So we measured nine. Now we'll go distally. Give the dilator again, nine, 10. Okay, important step. Antibiotic wash, syringe with antibiotic. Vinit, you didn't remind me antibiotic wash. What is this? I was actually thinking. Yes. So always keep on washing. More you wash, the better. But don't use Surfex cell. We go in and wash forcefully, suction, and we'll keep on washing. Okay. Now the dilator 910. Take 910 again. Uh, so another important uh, you know, use Not of the antibiotic water is that thing. we can have perforation detected. For example, if there's a cross perforation, we can see the antibiotic okay, solution sir. coming out from the so other we'll, side. We'll discuss that we when have we have a moment yes. when I don't have to focus. So now enter with nine. Now take this out. So now this part is important. Enter with nine. A little bit under vision. Go in. Enter. Now, now don't hold that. Now don't hold that. Now the trick is you hold the catheter. Okay. When I'm holding the catheter, one finger is on one corpus. The thumb is on the other corpus. Now, as long as the tip of the dilator is touching my finger, I cannot go wrong. So see how my hand is sliding distally towards the glands and the tip of the dilator is constantly touching the tip of my finger. As long as I'm doing that, I cannot go wrong. Otherwise I could cross perforate, I could enter the urethra, I could go in any direction. But I think there is fibrosis. There may be a plaque here. It's stuck at this level. It's not going further. But at least you come up to here, then I may have to do it. So and you're entered inside. Now hold the catheter and let the tip of the dilator touch your thumb. And always keep on sliding your thumb. Stretch the penis. And the dilator keeps on touching the thumb. So this is the safest way to dilate where you can't make a mistake. Now he's coming to a point where there is significant fibrosis. Can you feel the resistance? It's not going through. So I think I will have to force, come on that side and force it. It went through. Now he's scaring me. Okay, leave it. So now what? once you're near the corona, then you pull back the skin. So you see, okay, he has come up to here, which is proximal to the corona. Now at this point, it is important that you hold the gland straight. If you allow the glands to tilt, Either way, you will create a passage in the wrong direction. So the gland should be held so that it is right in line. Through the glands, your finger pushes on the dilator. And then it's a kind of railroading with your finger protecting the dilator so that you don't jerk through. And at the same time, the thumb and finger both holding the glands in the correct position. So right now you see the glands are still unstable. This is an important point. Can you see? This is a new gauze, please. Chuck this. That until you dilate into the tip of the corpus, the glands will be unstable. So this is not acceptable. Quick. 
you hear some screams, those were the few bacteria that were trying to escape. Okay, now uh, dry gauze, please. So you're going to now keep your thumb and finger here. Yeah, and hold the dilator and the, yeah, try to reach your thumb, but don't jerk. This is a difficult dilatation. I don't expect you to be able to do it into the glands, but just get the feel of it. Okay, see now the glands are tilting. It should be held like this. Don't allow it to go ventrally. So now there's a lot of resistance. Your thumb should protect it. Okay, leave. Don't overdo, but whatever he has done, you can see is not enough. I will come and do that. Just flip around once, put in one more side. Yeah, hold the stay, enter inside. Hold the catheter and let the tip of the dilator touch your thumb at all times. And let your thumb slide distally. And as it slides distally, go up to the corona. Okay, where have you reached? Okay, now can you move down, please? So he has gone in bravely and safely with uh, 10 and 11. Actually, he's done a good job. He's actually entered the glands. Very good. You can see the glands is less unstable. The tip has reached here. There's just a little bit left. And him not going there is a sign of caution. So you've done a good job dilating. See, now as we go in further, see, this is the floppy glands. Okay, and with the dilator in, it is more stable. Now, give me a smaller one. This is 10, 11. Yeah, now what we will see is if you're slightly smaller, and this is interesting, this is size nine. We come up to the corona, and now again, I'm holding my thumb on the tip, holding the direction of the glands and applying steady firm pressure so as to find our way into the tip. Now you can see the glands is stable. So what will happen is, why are we having echo? Okay. Uh, what will happen is that in the shaft, we will probably be able to fit 11 or 13, but in the tip, we will get only a nine. So I will show you a unique feature of the shine plant where we can remove the distal part of the sleeve so we can have our cake and eat it too. So in the glands, we will have a nine millimeter diameter. So it will fit nicely and give it support. But in the shaft, we will have 11 millimeters so that the shaft also is nice and stable. So this will be something interesting because there is fibrosis. So this dilator is now stabilized the glands very well. Now to make sure that in his bravery irrigation, he is not ruptured into the urethra, this step is very important. So what you have to do is make sure you're in the right plane, otherwise you'll have subcute edema. Make the nozzles. So I think sir has been put on mute. Can we please unmute him? We've lost voice from the theater. Uh, Arun sir, can we unmute Rupin sir? Because I think he was saying something in the middle of it. Uh, he, it became muted. The tip of the dilator here, bit now... lands. That is where it would come to. It doesn't go up to the very tip. But since we have had to force it here, at the end of the procedure, we may take one stitch to fix the implant so that it can't migrate through, so that if there is a mild tear, it will get time for the tear to heal again with fibrosis and the implant won't perforate through. Okay, very good job. Take the next dilator and go through. I'm coming around again. 
next size to him i thought this way it becomes much easier for people to understand everything rather than me just to look at them. okay next size gone in up to where has it gone Sister, quickly, otherwise the audience will disappear. Okay, hold the catheter, follow the thumb and stretch the penis so that the corpus is stretched. And after that, we'll use the sizer again. You're feeling some resistance. You can see it's pushing, it's breaking bands. Yeah, if it's too tight, stop there. But I think, it's so yeah, so he's definitely gone. What size is this? 11, 12? 11. 11. So probably 11 or 13 yeah. diameter will fit. And it's come up to the corona. So we know that the shaft can take at least 11 and the tip of the corpus can take 9. So if you had to choose between WH11 and 13, the minimum diameter of WH13 is 11 millimeter. The minimum diameter of WH11, the minimum diameter of WH13 is 11 millimeters. The minimum diameter of WH11 is 9 millimeters. So we would choose WH11 so that we can get 9 millimeters in the tip. So that is one more consideration if you are in doubt. So one more antibiotic, a sizer and then an antibiotic wash. Take the sizer, put it in. Yeah, cat spa retractor, please. Yeah. yeah. Feel the catheter, push it in. Okay, don't if you don't have it, don't take it. Give me the small right angle. Sister, let it be chordo, sister. No. Right angle. Yeah. Has it reached the tip? Not going? Okay. Take it out. Put the dilator in. The number 910, smaller dilator. Smaller it is so definitely you, tight. Yeah. So would you use the cavernotome for distal dilatation beyond? Uh, here you won't need it. And here we don't have it. Actually, what would happen is if with repeated dilatation, you'd be able to open it. If I was at home with my cavernotomy, I would spin it around once. But the cavernotome sizes are six, seven, eight, nine. We've already gone beyond nine. So the cavernotome is actually useful when you have severe fibrosis. Yeah. Okay. So I'm retracting the cremaster. So now you can see, yeah, the tunica. Pull it out, ruler to him, please. That looks like seven, eight again. So nine and seven. nine and seven, 16. My feeling is that's a wrong measurement. My expectation is we'll probably need 18 or 19 total length. So we'll measure that later. So one last wash quickly, and then we'll come to the opposite side. You want to do the other side? Then switch sides. Okay, so now Aman is going to do the left side. So both of you can switch sides. So now we're coming to the opposite side. If there was a lot of bleeding, you can see virtually no bleeding in this corpus. Then you could twist it like that and that would control the bleeding. If there's no bleeding, so we leave it open. I usually prefer to have one straight mosquito, one curved mosquito. So I know which is medial, which is lateral. So now we're going to repeat the same procedure on the opposite side. So I dig in and pull out the penis so that he doesn't go too distal. A right angle retractor here. Broad right angle. Take a mosquito in your hand to divide the buck's fascia. You can see once again, the buck's fascia is intact. Yeah, enter it. Keep a forceps in your hand, open your mosquito wide. Okay, cut. Yeah, so you see the white shiny buck's fascia that gets exposed. 
camera work is really good. Very nice. Okay. Keep the stay sutures ready, sister. Yeah, a little deeper because initially, later on, your corporal tummy is going to be deeper. Yeah. Open it wide. Don't damage the urethra. Only I'm allowed to do that. Okay, done. Stay suture. The first time I did a penile implant, okay, mosquito, quick, quick mosquito. So again, visualize the incision. The incision is going to be here. Okay, now place the suture on either side. Was when Dr. Raju Thomas was in those days, not even chairman of the department, came to KM Hospital with one AMS 650 malleable implant. And he assisted and Professor Pardani did one side and I did the other side. And that was the beginning way back in 85. That is why I'm happy to have Aman and Surag do it. Someday after 20 years, they'll remember me and say, yeah, our first implant we did with Rupin. Sister, hold this, please. Next one. Stab knife ready. So it has to be parallel and it has not to be too far apart, but still enough room to be able to incise. Hold, uh, hold it. Down. Yeah, triple click. Yeah. If we were doing an inflatable, we would place this with a absorbable suture and tie the two later on. Here we are going to remove these. Okay, clamp and cut. 11 number blade. No, hold it like this. This, Yeah, so urethra is here. Get oriented. Where is the urethra? Where is this? So now open it between the two. Yeah. You're a little lateral, more lateral than I would have liked to be, but it's still okay. Open, steely scissors ready, vertical cut. So this has to be lifted up. Yeah, tunic has to be lifted up. Okay, and distally a little. Okay, take the scissors, find the distal plane, lift up the tunica. Yeah, feel the catheter is here. So, yeah, yeah, and yeah, open it wide, but not too wide. It should be under vision. Yeah, that gives enough room for the dilator. Very good. Now, proximally, you have to be able to see the tunic, no, like this. So, proximally, I'm in the opening. I'm feeling and seeing. Can you see that? I'm seeing the tunica. So I'm under vision going down and I know this the direction. So I'm actually feeling my way, scraping almost out of the tunica to find the plane. Dilator ready, take the dilator. So I'm actually kind of creating a plane. Take the dilator between the corpus, the cavernosal tissue and the tunica. Okay, now I'm almost at the bone. Go in, go in. Now, again, the direction. This is the direction, okay? This is the wrong direction. It should curve outwards. Here, curve it, visualize the shape. Yeah, now you have to hold the penis, not the stair suture. And slow rocking movement. No, that's too oblique. It should be more or less vertical to go in. Yeah. Yeah. So he's feeling the bone. Yeah. It's correct. Take it out, flip around. Sister, next dilator ready. Flip it around. There are two duck sizes to that. You went with the larger. So go in with the larger. Dilator. Next dilator ready. And after that, irrigation and sizer. Hmm. Okay, out next dilator. This side seems to have less fibrosis. Go in, Pfizer ready with the markings. Yeah, flip it around. 
Any questions from our team of super experts? Uh, okay. Sir, would you recommend to newbies Fine. that uh, they could, you know, keep a, a dilator on the opposite side while they are doing the dilator? Yeah, sure. I think we should there? show that trick just as a precaution in the beginning. So I'll show that. Because the dilatation was very easy here, I didn't insist on that, but it's worth showing it or mentioning it. Right now it is eight and a half. Eight and a half. So same as last side. So one way when you dilate this side is to keep a dilator there. The dilator, please. Any dilator, sister? Put it in. Put it in. Put it in. Yeah. Second dilator. And then when you dilate here, that reduces the risk of counter perforation to the opposite side. Have we twisted? Yeah. And when you go in correctly, what you will see is that the two will be equal. So this is known as the goalpost sign, where they are parallel like goalposts and equal. So that helps you know. Antibiotic wash, go in, push it in properly, and now flush. Suction quickly, bring it here, otherwise it will wet the whole dressing. Yeah. Now we have to go distally. Dilator again, narrow one. So enter inside. Okay. No, this has to be straight. Scissors to hogya. Enter. Is this the smaller one? I think you have one smaller than this. This is 10. What is that size? This is bigger. Okay, go in with that. Okay. Once you're in, first you enter under vision. Yeah, enter under vision so you know you're in the right plane. Now, hide the catheter, hold the catheter. Ah. Thumb and finger will hold the catheter. In your case, it will be finger and thumb. And the tip of the dilator has to touch the tip of the finger as you stretch. Are you feeling it? Yes. Tip, yeah. Keep on stretching. Don't let the tip move away from the finger. That is your guide to ensure that you will dilate correctly and without a problem. Once you reach corona, our grip will change. So if you're at the coronal sulcus, now we pull this back. He's already reached inside. You can see, you can feel the tip right here and it is stable. It pull out a little, this is drooping. Now you go in, this is stable. So he's already in. So this side is less fibrosis. Flip to the next side. So probably we might wind up using a 13 millimeter diameter here an 11 millimeter diameter there. Again, thumb and finger, follow your finger at all times and stretch the penis as you go. Stretch. Ruler ready, sister, marking. Reach the tip. Have you reached the tip? Okay. Hold, put in the marking, pull it out, measure. Yeah, that looks like eight again. So on both sides, they've measured eight and nine and eight. Nine and eight, so 17. I think eventually it will turn out to be size larger. Antibiotic wash. No, you're in the wrong plane. If you enter the subcute plane, there'll be penile edema, yeah. The penis should enlarge, yeah. And you should not see anything happening there. Come out. Okay, so one betadine swap for the whole area. So now we've completed dilating. We've reached about 11, 12 on both sides. And the length that we've measured is about 16, 17 centimeter, but looking at the penis, I think the final length will be about 18 to 19. So we'll see that. And we know that on the right tip, it is narrower, left tip is a little broader. So now we want to know several things, what length of the, which model to use. So we had already measured this as 12, we'll measure it once more, ruler please. So the stretched length from the point of hinging, 
this is the point of hinging to the point that we dilated up to. Where is the marking? Yeah. Okay. So from the hinge to the mid glands, wipe it and read it. How much is it? 12. So 12. So our choice is WH11, 13, for reasons that I've explained, we are going to use model WH11. Now the second question is what diameter do we use? Just a dilator, broad one, 11, 12, broadest dilator that you have. What diameter is that? This to me looks like a 13. So push it in and then keep the next dilator ready. Going in. Yeah. On this side, we're using the broader one. The sizing is a little different. It says 15. I think that's about 13 millimeters. Next dilator, gone. Not cross the corona. Yeah, not crossing the corona. We know that at the corona, we are going to have to narrow it down. Leave it there. Take the next dilator, sister. What? Is, huh? This one is same size. Okay, try. This also looks like a 13. Push it in. Where's the opening? Oh, there's something wrong. Yes. Yeah. You have to see it correctly. There's no guesswork. Push it in. Yeah. Okay. So now with both 13s in. Okay. Fine. In the shaft, they are snug. You can see there's a little groove between the two. Feel it. If they were too narrow, there would be a big space between the fingers, between the two dilators, and they would wobble. There should be a little groove palpable, not so tight that you think it would be painful. So you can see here, I can feel a little space between them here. So this size looks okay. So I think in the main shaft, 1313 would fit. But when we have 1313, you can see one tip is here, one tip is here. The glands is partly supported, but not fully supported. It's not too bad, but it's gone up to here. So I think we will use WH11. We will use 13 millimeters for the shaft, and we will remove one or both sleeves to fit into the glands so that the glands will be either 11 or 9. So with that, we will have the best fit in the glands and we will have the best fit in the shaft, okay? So we have selected the model by measuring the stretch length. We've decided the diameter of the shaft. We've decided the diameter of the tip. The last thing that remains is the length of the implant. What we have measured is 16, 17. Usually the length you will get is the stretch length plus seven. Our stretch length was 12. So I expect 18 and a half or 19. So before we cut the implant, we will put it in and I will show you how to measure the length of the implant against the length of the penis. Okay, everything is clear. So take a, give one swab of that uh, spirit with what? Chlorhexidine, wipe the whole area. And after this now, sister, we're going to use new gloves. So wipe the penis, wipe all the instruments. Remove the dilators, remove the old gauze pieces, take an antibiotic wash and wash proximally and distally. Do all of that. Meanwhile, sister, are you wearing single gloves or double gloves? You're on double gloves. Fine. So you can just take chlorhexidine on your gloves and wipe them clean. I'm going to remove my outer glove and wear a new glove. Now I will want powder-free gloves. So first take first take chlorhexidine on your gloves and wash them. Yeah. You don't know. Okay. Fine. Come on, guys. You're, wait, wait, wait. You all have more work to do. Wipe, wipe the whole area. Uh, the skin, the instruments, the plastic with chlorhexidine, get rid of all the gauze pieces with an antibiotic wash up and down. Do all of that first. Get it out of here. We don't want anything here. Wipe the cautery, wipe the suction with chlorhexidine. You got new gloves for me? And okay, so first pour betadine on my gloves. You took chlorhexidine, right? Yeah. So pour betadine on my gloves. 
Pour, 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 pour. Okay, very good. Stop. Now, powder free gloves, and I need WH11. And we want a new kidney tray, or we'll use that tray itself. Okay, don't worry. WH11. Uh, WH11, where is the implant? Wait, wait, don't come so close. Wait there. This is not powder free. Powder free, really? Now, this is powder free. That's not powder free. I want powder free one. That's powder free? Yeah. Really? Powder -free, yeah. Okay, you can give that because my powder frees are brown. This is also powder free. Okay. We have green powder free. We are, no, no, this is left hand. Wait, 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 wait. Just keep it open. You guys finish there? Washed, cleaned, everything. No bacteria survives. Okay, so sister, uh, your single glove, double glove. No, so remove your outer glove. Take betadine on the inner glove and wear a powder-free glove. Okay, now I need an Alice. So, yeah, open the packet. Yeah. So now we are taking WH11. No, we'll bring it here. So this is WH11. You can't see the outer packet. We'll open this. And no, I'm not keeping in the kidney tray. I'll keep it here. Give me some betadine, please. So nowadays, instead of putting it in the kidney tray, we'll put the antibiotic in the groove itself. Everybody wear gloves. You have to wear your... No, no, not there. Don't worry. Give me betadine in a syringe. So we'll just put some in this channel itself. We'll put some antibiotic, uh, some betadine and some antibiotic solution so that it is reasonably dilute and covered. So it's just placebo value. The bacteria are laughing, but I feel happy. So now this is the implant. It has two sleeves. If you remove the outer sleeve, the diameter will become 11 millimeters. If you remove both sleeves, the diameter will become nine millimeters. And if I make a cut like this, I can remove one sleeve or both sleeves only from the distal end. This is the only implant in the world where you can actually have such a differential rigidity. And today is a good case to see how the differential rigidity works. We will first try to go in with 13 and see whether it reaches the tip. Probably it won't. Then we'll remove one sleeve and then see how it goes. In. So that will be a good demonstration of what we have to do. So now I'm waiting for the two operating surgeons to come. You should not be wearing the gloves. Sister should be making you wear it. There's a reason, reason for that, that when you touch it, the outer part gets contaminated. Sister opening it is not for sure, even though we are on TV. It's to prevent contamination. Hmm. Okay, uh, you took betadine? You, uh, sister, give him the second glove. So take betadine. So as obsessive as you can get to avoid infection, the better. The initial surgery we did with regular gloves, but now for handling the implant, we are using powder free. You're okay, why are you changing? Okay, so sister will open for you. Sister, that's for him. Okay, guys, Raman, Vineet, Sujata, any query, comment, question, words of wisdom for the audience? Sir, uh, uh, excellent. Uh, obviously, uh, we have all learned from you and therefore uh, we definitely follow the steps which you have told us. And sir, uh, suppose this corporal fibrosis could not be tackled with the corporal tone, then what would be your suggestion, sir? If we can't Dilate the corporal fibrosis? Is ah, that yes, your question? Sir, with the, yes, sir. Yes. So I think you'll always be able to dilate eventually. But it may happen that some area may be less dilated. And the beauty of this implant is that there have been times when I've shaved part of the implant to make it narrow to fit a narrowed segment. And if the corporal fibrosis is difficult to dilate, what you have to do is telescope the whole shaft out like this. 
well, I'm not dissecting to avoid edema, but you can actually telescope the whole shaft out. Under vision, make a corporotomy at the site of fibrosis, excavate some of the fibrosis and then dilate beyond that. And when the implant comes there, at that location, you may have to shave it a little so that you can still close the corpora without having to put a mesh. Because the moment you put a mesh or anything, you're increasing the risk of infection. Okay, everybody's set? Fine. So now, uh, right angle retractor, open up. We'll open up the better side first. So this side was better. Right angle retractor here. Did you wash up and down? Yes. Okay. Put the retractor in place. A broad okay. one. So now we want to confirm the diameter of the implant and the length of the implant. So push it in proximally. See if it's going in. We still haven't increased our corporotomy. That step is pending. Going, going in all the hitting bone. Okay, let me see. Yeah, it's probably gone in. So approximately no problem. Now we stretch it against the penis. Okay, we can see when we stretch against the penis that the implant is about a centimeter and a half too long. And this is an 18 and a half centimeter implant. So probably we'll have to cut it to 17 centimeters. So that length which was measured was correct. Show me the ruler, please, sister. So if you measure against the ruler, this ruler is a small scale. We'll have to measure again. So if we start, no, you have to start from here, from the tip, this is 15. And it's 19 and a half. Uh, 19 and a half, it's at nine and a half. So it's 19 and a half, and we found it to be one and a half centimeters long. So it'll come to 18, which is what we predicted, that 12 plus 7, 19, so 18, 19. So we measured 17. The stretch of the penis against the implant suggests it's 18. So we're going to cut it to 18 and see how it fits. Now, the second thing we want to do is see distally. So hold it and push it distally in. Let us see how far it goes. Does it reach the tip or does it stop at the corona? Sir, the implant also the same technique as dilatation. Sorry? Yeah, like a dilator. It'll go like a dilator. Except that now you don't have to take the precautions because the passage is open. It says 20 on that? Okay. Okay, so it's 20. So then it comes to 18 and a half. Okay. Now, where has it reached? Let's see. So it is stopping somewhere here. So obviously, that's quite inadequate. So let's dilate again. Give the large dilator. Give me. Give him the large dilator. Give me beta dean. Yeah, take the dilator. Take the dilator. Give me beta dean. So what happens is when you're using an inflatable, you don't have to worry so much about dilating because the inflatable will gradually stretch the penis. But when you're using a non-inflatable, it's important to dilate because the size that you reach is the size that you will get forever. Yeah, same way, hold the catheter and follow your tip. It seems 13 may be too much. You might have to go to 11. Not going, right? No, okay. Flip with this side and try, flip it around. So we need here now a cavernotome may not help because we've already stretched it. I think this is a limitation of the tunica itself. The cavernotome is more useful either to scrape tissue out if you have the cavarelli cavernotome or to separate the tunica from the fibrosis if you're using the uramex. Okay, this has gone up to the tip. So now, what does this diameter correspond to? Because I can't make out against the implant. You compare the implant, yeah. You can see the implant is wider than the dilator. So definitely one sleeve we'll have to remove. Okay, antibiotic wash up and down. There's a question whether you use a jelly to lignocaine jelly to slide the dilator. Huh? Sorry, do you use what? 
Uh, no, I. You don't need jelly. If you have to lubricate, I would use either betadine or antibiotic solution. I don't like the jelly coming in. I think it messes up things. It's sticky and yucky. All urologists love it. So people have also asked that if there's difficulty dilatation, should you put in a scope? Should you put in a VIU? Uh, the truth is, as Dr. Chawla was telling me, that an endourology theater is never perfectly sterile. The moment you bring in your scopes, your tubes, and other fluids, you're increasing your risk of infection. Okay, so we have done the dilatation. Now we're going to remove one sleeve, then see how it fits. Then we'll have to increase the corporatomy to put it in. Till now, we have not increased the corporatomy because once we increase the corporatomy, the corpora get a little distorted and the sizing gets affected. So let's remove two mosquitoes. Camera is seeing it, yeah. Hold the outer sleeve with two mosquitoes. Hold here, take a mosquito. Mm -hmm. Hold here, steely scissors, pull it back. So there are two ways in which you can remove the sleeve. You can put the scissors between the two sleeves, but then you might injure the inner sleeve. Instead, if you pull it back and then cut between the mosquitoes, you will never injure the inner sleeve. So hold again. So this part is a little inelegant. We've tried to create perforations and things, but we haven't been able wait, wait, wait. We haven't been able to make it more elegant, but it's effective. It works. So keep on holding the inner sleeve. Where's the inner sleeve? It's in your hand, right? So he's holding the inner sleeve, pulling the outer sleeve back, and we are cutting the folded sleeve. So at no point am I scratching the inner sleeve. Pull back, pull back. Very good. Hold it. It's a good yeah, yeah, hold it here and pull. But you have to keep on holding the inner sleeve because otherwise it could slide off. So that's important. Yeah. Yeah, wait, don't overdo it because when you do that, you can loosen the distal tip. Yeah, now pull. Last bit remaining. Slowly pull it off now, it will come. Okay. So now we are at 11 millimeter. We can still make the tip nine if we want to. Betadine, please expose the corpora, wash up and down. Betadine here. Irrigation, antibiotic. Wash up and down, half and half. Yeah. Make sure you're inside each time. Often the mistake at this stage is you put it in the subcute plane and inject. So then the patient has unnecessary edema in the post-op period. Okay, now take the implant, put it in. Push it in proximally, and then we'll measure the stretch length again. Yeah, now it should walk in easily. Now stretch, pull here and stretch the penis. Stretch it up. We want to measure the length of the implant against the length of the penis. I'm pulling down the glands, holding, and stretching. So I think about one and a half centimeters if we cut. That should be perfect. Okay, see, does it go in distally now all the way? Here we don't have the plastic drape. Otherwise, usually I prefer a plastic drape on the skin so that the implant doesn't touch the skin. Has it reached into the glands? Okay, let's see where it has reached. So now the implant is coming here. Can you see? It's still not all the way. It's at this point. So it's not entered the glands. It's at here, this point. Now that means about two centimeters of distal sleeve we have to remove. And then you will see the implant will reach here. At this point, if you put the implant in, 
you're going to have a droopy gland. So some people have a big series with the droopy glands. It's because they have not adjusted the size of the implant correctly. Can we increase the AC? Because the cooler the theater, lower is the bacterial count. It's become quite warm. So we are up to here just now. So now 11 number blade, please. Dip it in betadine and give it to us. We're going to remove the distal sleeve. Okay. Now take it very gently. You have to make a circumferential cut so that only the outer sleeve is removed. So you hold it. I'm going to rotate it at that point. Okay. Now this is tricky. If he presses too much, he'll cut into the implant. If he doesn't press enough, the sleeve won't get cut. That's why I made him do it so I can blame him later. Take the mosquito. Hold the distal sleeve. Scissors, please. Yeah, start peeling. He's done a perfect cut. You can see that like an expert. So it's just peeling off completely. Yeah, peel it off. And it's gone. So now we have our cake and eat it too. The distal part is 9 millimeters and the shaft is 11 millimeters. Now let's see if it goes in distally. Then when beta in swab after that. So why not just remove both sleeves? Because then the shaft would be too wobbly. Has it gone in them? Yeah, put the tail well in there. Now it should go, just push. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah, now it's right here in the glands up this point. Earlier it was here. Now it's come here. And you see the glands doesn't droop anymore. So it's reached a good position. So now you use it as a dilator so it finds its place. See where it has reached. It's almost right there. So that is what we've achieved now. Now the last step remains, which is to just open the corporotomy. Stout artery to me, sister, because this corporotomy is not big enough to put the implant in stout artery. So we need to extend it. Take a steely scissors. I open the corporotomy. And now you have to cut it, but see, feel where is the urethra so that you're cutting away from the urethra, leaving enough margin. So, yeah. Cut between the two blades. That is the center of the corpus. Cut a little more. Yeah. And just a little more. That should be it. It should be big enough to bend the implant. Urethra is there. Safe. Should not be so deep you have difficulty closing later on because I'm going to run away. You're going to struggle. Now ruler and knife, please. We are going to cut one and a half centimeters and see. Mm -hmm. Ruler, 11 number blade. So cut one and a half centimeters. So we'll keep it like this so it's well supported. Now see one and a half centimeters and cut it. Camera is seeing it. Yeah. So hold it so that, yeah, now it's seen. We'll get to one and a half. And we have rare tip extenders, one and a half. That looks like two centimeters. One and a half? Okay. So if he overcuts, we can still compensate by one, two, or three centimeters. And how to judge whether the length is right, I'll show you the next step after that. Okay. Now, which side should you put first, distal or proximal? That depends on which was more difficult. In this case, the distal is more difficult, so push that first. If the prox sometimes the proximal way that gauze, betadine gauze, leave it here. I don't want the implant to touch the skin. Yeah, go in. Yeah, push it in all the way into the glands. So here, you will then bend it to put it in. If your corporotomy is too distal, you'll be bending the stiff part. Okay, it reached the tip. Fine. Now put the retractor in so you can see the proximal end. Not yet. Push, push, push. Put the retractor in. Yes. Okay, before he perforates, let me touch. 
Yeah, it's a very good position. Everybody can see he's done a great job. Now, can you see the proximal end? So you have to do a figure of four, bend it like this and push it in. So it should go in a vertical line. Yeah. Now he's got a nice big corporal Tommy, so he doesn't have to struggle. Pushes it in and then flips it around. Went nicely. Now we have to see one. Is there any bulge? If there's a bulge, that means it's too long. So there's no bulge. It's going in nicely. Is it reaching the tip? Yeah, nicely at the tip. Dry gauze, please. And the last thing, is it too short? So how do we judge that? Feel where the tip is. It's over here. Now I'm going to pull the glands. When I lift the glands, where does the tip come? It came here. That means it is short by a centimeter because there is one centimeter play. Everybody understood that? This is a very important step. All those who do inflatable implants never know this because the implant will elongate. But here, it's important. The tip is here, but I'm able to stretch the penis and it drops here. So this stretch is the extra length available. Rare tip extender, Hogai may take a one centimeter rare tip extender. Yes, yeah, one, two, and three, take the one centimeter. Take an Alice, pull out the implant from the proximal end. Alice to him, that's one centimeter. Show all three, keep them on my gloves so people can see one, two, and three. This is a cutter. This is to cut the implant. This we don't need. Put the, okay, this, what you gave was not one. This is one, this is, yeah, these two are one. There should be a two also. Yeah, two. Yeah, keep two and three so people can see it. This is three. And so, okay, so you have one, two, and three. Okay, we're going to use a one centimeter here. So put these back, keep the one in your hand ready, dip it in betadine, hold the retractor, and with an Alice, pull out the proximal end. Instead of cooling it, they switched it off. Okay, yeah, just the proximal end, not the distal end. You've already struggled with the distal end. So again, push the distal. Now fit, wash with betadine and fit the one centimeter. Yeah. So basically, we come to that formula 12 plus 7, 19 centimeters. That is what we eventually will fit. So often, while measuring, there's an error. That's why these are the methods all. Now push it in again. And now we will see that it will fit better. So these little things will ensure the final retractor best result with yes. the shine plant. Yeah, now it's gone in. If to, there's no bulge when I'm touching it. It's nice at the tip. Now take a gauze and see. There's no play. Hold it. Try to pull the glands. Feel where the tip is. Uh, focus on the tip, please. Camera, move out. Yeah. Yeah. Feel where it is and now try to lift it. Yeah, it's only there. It should have some play. If it's too tight, it'll risk erosion. So see, this is the maximum position it can come to when I pull the glands on the implant. And when I push the glands off the implant, it comes here. So it still has some play, but now the position is much better. I could actually put half centimeter more given the amount of play that there is, but I think this is quite safe. Okay, this is something very important for the experienced implanters. And now if we see with one implant in place, if I hold the base, it's already fairly stable. With the second one in place, he'll be a rock star. Okay, now let's expose the other corpus, wash it back in front, irrigation. Other side uh, yeah, after about 15 minutes, we'll still need 15. What's the time now? 1.40. Oh, 12.40. Oh, very good. 12.40. Oh, so at 1, we'll start that side. So we have, we're in good time. We have expert surgeons operating, so they've been very fast. Irrigate back in front. Enter the corpus. Dorse. Okay, proximally. Sure, can switch. They're trying to decide who should give the treat. So therefore, they are switching roles. So both are equally responsible. 
Okay, switch sides. Sister, meanwhile, give me a betadine swab. So there's a special mantra you have to recite when you're putting betadine, but that is only part of the advanced workshop. I can't tell you just now. Okay, now again, we have to look at the implant. Just for formality, try putting in the 13 as it is. Just to see whether it goes distally. You don't expect that it will go. You can see the corporotomy, enter inside and push, push, push. Sometimes you get surprised and it may go, in which case we may keep 13, but less likely the way it was. Which only up to mid shaft, right? Take it out. One, leave it in. Let's see how snug it is. There is room. Take the dilator, please. Large dilator. See how far the dilator goes. So all this wastes a little time. Those of you who are on a time limit that we have to finish our implant in 40 minutes will not do all this. But I think this time is worth it. This went easily, right? Flip to the other side will eventually give the best result. And that is particularly true, as I said, with the non-inflatable. With the inflatable, the implant compensates for your inadequacies. How far has it gone? Up to corona. So definitely for the tip, we are going to remove the sleeve. But we want to see whether 13 can fit the shaft. Otherwise, we'll make it 11 and 9. Yes. Okay. Proximally once, since you have the dilator. Give the dilator, dilator, dilator. Go in proximally. Proximally is not a problem. Leave it there. Take the implant. Yeah, try going with 13 once. I don't think it will go. But one last try. Yeah, you can. That's the beauty of this implant. So it gives you the best fit. With all other implants, you fit to one size. No, it's still only up to here. The one option is to remove four centimeters of the outer sleeve and two centimeters of the inner and outer sleeve. So we'll have a step-like effect. I'm trying to see how much room there is between the two. Okay, let's do that. Knife, please. So we're going to remove the outer sleeve here at four centimeters. Hmm. Yeah, I know four, take the knife. Uh, cut through one sleeve first. Hold it with the mosquito. So here we're trying to remove one sleeve so it becomes 11. Pull it. Scissors, please. Now just cut between the two. Now we have, this is 13, this is 11. Now let's cut the distal sleeve here. Or let's first try with this, see how it goes. So there'll be some difficulty because a sharp edge creates a problem, but as he rotates, it'll find its way. Yeah, very good. It's So that part has now been negotiated. He's reached here. So if you remove the distal part, it should come here. So take it out. Knife, please. Now we'll remove half of the distal sleeve here. Sometimes the patients get pain from the rough edge, but usually it's not a problem. 11 number blade. And again in the middle here. Yeah, you're right in the middle of this. Again, through the outer sleeve only. 
He holds the knife, I rotate, he applies the pressure. Mosquitoes. Cameraman, you're doing a very good job. Yeah. Okay, so we have 9, 11, 13. And we want to cut the length. Last time we had cut too much. Let's just cut one centimeter. Knife, please. Ruler. Cut a centimeter. Time to again wash the corpora because we've gone in so many times. And then we'll again check proximal and distal. Okay. Wash it. Proximal and distal. And then we'll increase our corporal tummy also. Are you properly in? Make sure. Okay. Yeah. Wash. And proximal. Proximal, proximal. And then stout artery to me. Give the irrigation first. First the irrigation. And then sister three zero monocryl. Uh, roughly two centimeters is enough. It could be actually this is almost enough already. Just a little bit more. If it's bigger, it goes in more easily. That's all. So pull pull the suture so it's straight. Yeah. And go through the apex. Just a little bit. I think two, three millimeters more. We'll make it fine. You want to cut distally a little? Just uh, again a millimeter or two. Make it easier. Okay, let we'll see if required. I think this will be a little tight. Take the implant. So again, what is difficult here is the distal part, so push it distally first. Then at the end, we want to fix the implant. So after we do everything, we'll take one stitch through the tunica, implant tunica, and tie it. Has it reached the tip? Yeah, beautiful. If you can see, it's just a millimeter short of this. But right then, see the glands now? Nice and stable. So push it a little, it'll find its way. Okay, and now if you feel here, because we did one and then one, it's not a steep step, just a little difference in diameter, but the step will not be painful. If we'd remove both, it would be in a more sudden step. Okay, show him the proximal end. Retract properly. You see the proximal end? If it's difficult, hold the corner with an alice. Wait, where's the corner? So you can visualize the opening. Is there enough room to flex and put it in? Unlikely. So we'll have to extend it. So hold the apex with an alice. Alice, put it. Hold the side of the apex so we can open it. Yeah, artery. Until it's coming in the way, take it out. So if you make a big corporatomy to begin with, then your insertion is elegant like it happened on the first side. Here the corporatomy, push it in, I can't see the edge. You're in. Okay, now I'm opening it wide. Take the blade. Blade will cut the scissors wasn't cutting. Now put a second dilator, a second retract. Yeah, feel the scissors and feel the and now cut urethra is on my finger, so cut. Cut, cut, cut more at least a centimeter. Yeah, if you hold it with a forceps and stretch, you'll be able to cut better. Retract, yeah. Stretch it with the forceps, yeah, and now cut. 
an ls ready see now it gets easily okay now put an ls on that corner so you have control over the corner retract let him hold with the ls any one side hold the corner yeah now it's easy push it in okay i'm going to take it out are you in position yes are you seeing under vision so you have to make it yeah to the push should be in the axis of the implant then at the last minute you twist it around and undo the figure of four and pop it in popped in no so that means it's still not gone in fully you have to push it in more and then actually this hasn't gone in at all Take it out and see. Why is this sleeve? Come here. Where's the opening? Retract in place. Still needs to be a little bigger. The opening because the sleeves are not passing in. So having a slightly bigger corporotomy is always better. It's two minutes more to closure, but everything becomes a lot more elegant. Yeah, this is not going. You'll have to increase the corporotomy. Pulling out the implant, keep it with beta dim. Hold the two corners with an alice on either side. On the other side. Give me a dilator, please, sister. Large dilator. So one way of increasing the corporate tummy with 100% secrecy is put the dilator. And now you cut on the center of the dilator with your blade. So advance this retractor here. Yeah. Yeah, now cut one centimeter more. Okay, fine. Perfect. Advance this ellipse to hold this corner open. Now it's nicely seen. Okay, now take the implant. Push the proximal end first now. Yeah, because the sleeves were getting stuck. Yeah, sleeves gone in. Okay, now bend it to see the distal end. And now when you push the distal end, you have to put your finger underneath here so that the tip doesn't hit the posterior wall, but it goes in straight. Yeah, use your fingers to guide it in straight. Yeah, correct, yeah, correct. So that gives it the vertical, the longitudinal, orientation right here at the tip Show the tip, please, camera. Yeah. So both are right here. Here. Is there any bulge? Remove the aliases. No, no bulge. Very snug. Tips are right here. Equal. Glands is very stable. Rigidity is very good. And initially, you'll be keeping it in an up position. In a month, the edema will settle. Then even down will be possible. But whatever is comfortable for him. And there is still enough play. This one may be half a centimeter too long, I think. Because as I'm pulling it, this has no play. And the glands is tilting just a little. I think ideally this we should 
shortened by half a centimeter. Okay, so Alice, please. Yeah, retractor in. Pull it out. So this fine tuning we do takes a little time, but eventually it gives the best result. Pull out the proximal end only. Ruler and knife, please. Just half a centimeter. Yes, we keep it somewhere here. So it's well supported. And cut five to six millimeters. Okay, push it in. And after this closure, wash with antibiotic. Wash the implant quickly. Antibiotic. 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 Yeah, on the implant and inside. Okay, inside. Enter in. Okay, now push it in. Can you see the opening? Take your forceps to help him pull open the corner. Yeah. Just to hold the retractor. You seeing the opening? Yeah. Seeing it? If you can't see it, first see the opening. Hold it with an Alice. You see still off. Got it? Just to hold the Alice on soon. Okay, yeah, leave it there. Grab the implant. Okay, once you're ready, I'll pull out the dilator for you. Are you in place? Yes. Ready to go? Yes. Watch the opening and push in. Yeah, figure of four, push, push, push. Here yeah, that sleeve is buckling, so you may have to perhaps put the proximal end first if it traps over there, but it's gone in. Yeah. Now the two are perfectly equal. See, the glance tilt has gone. It's a very minor thing. Perfect. Okay. Everything done. One betadine swab, please, quickly, and then three zero monocryl. Okay, start closure. Right angle retractors in. Okay, guys. So this was it. Now any questions? So one question Raman had asked, what will you do if there are perforations? So it depends on what perforation and where. If it's a proximal perforation, usually that is one centimeter distal to the tip because that is where there's most fibrosis. So in such cases, I've shortened the implant so that it falls, it reaches short of the perforation and then stitched it in place through the corpora. Nice thick bites. If it's a crossover perforation distally from one to the other, you will recognize it because one implant will go in and the second won't. In which case, what you have to do is first redilate the side which wasn't dilated, put an implant in that side, and then with the implant in place, the other side will go in. Make a triple click, yeah. Hold the needle, hold it tight. So, sir, uh, in this uh, crossover uh, perforation, there is no need to suture. Uh, if at all, you can see the corporal tear. No, there's no if need. If we can see, no need. And the no another need. one which you are telling at the tip of the glance, uh, the suture which you take to fix the implant would be a proline suture or? No, because even if the suture lasts three weeks, that is long enough for the long perforation enough. with fibrosis. Okay, sir. So, so even uh, 
keep it for a longer time yeah but uh, we only want 3 weeks you are saying that sir yeah okay uh so and one question uh, i have a fellow of mine from cambodia so he is watching the entire thing with me uh sir one yeah. of the question that uh, which uh, i think uh, promoter mm -hmm. also put is how often do you not have to use an rear tip extender as in like sir can we do without it and when you don't use it do you shave it off to make it more smoother uh, or do you just use it uh, bluntly like the way it is on the right side we've not used a rear tip extender yes sir so and but we want to kind of modify it a bit by the blade by making it a little more conical or something like uh, that sir actually we've not been doing it and it's not created a problem it sounds a nice problem, right. and from that point of view you might say okay for every case i'll cut and put the extender so it's more rounded i think you had told me once that sometimes you had a problem with the rear tip extender coming out yes sir so i always suture so the rear tip extender by using the implant and the extender so that yes, would be sir. the only disadvantage of using the extender uh, it's going to be continuous so six knots because it's monocrill and then cut the short end and continue continuous simple no need to lock it so uh, later first we'll close everything then we'll take the stitch so you could do either way i often don't put it and i have not had a problem but if you feel better with a nice rounded end then rather than shave the implant it would be better to cut it by a centimeter and put the 1 cm rear tip extender and then as you've suggested maybe you could just take one fixation suture right sir appreciate it sir but also so we've have not like in this case one side we've used and one side we have an nice thick bites sir so how so often do you find that these implant sizes are different on the right and the left uh in a fair number of cases now what happens is for using any of the other malleables you don't have that choice so you use whatever size you've decided but here because we have the choice often we will try and fine tune it like here i could have put 11 and 11 on both and if i was using a different type of malleable it would have been 11 11 here because i have the choice of 11 13 i will keep on trying to fine tune it to the best possible size so therefore often and this distal removal of the sleeve i think in almost one third of cases we do and it definitely improves as you could see today it definitely improves the fit in the glands and Amazing. that's very important to avoid a glandulopexy or rather it's very important because it helps you avoid a glandulopexy because so if the glands is we love free, about this implant that you know we can just give the best fit possible it's completely kind of yeah. customized but the that's why i also say it's a disadvantage because it's a thinking surgeon's implant you need to understand all the maneuvers that we showed today to be able to get the best out of it if you try to use it like an ordinary malleable then you will lose the potential flexibility and advantages of this implant in fact so this is what we uh, tell all the patients also this is a backup implant even if they are desiring another implant whether it's a malleable or an inevitable because uh, if nothing is possible the shy implant this will always yeah uh, absolutely sir, you should always have this as a backup if you are doing we've done one case now of immediate implant in a priapism case who did well and in that case also we use the sha if you're doing a salvage where somebody has an infection and you want to salvage and put an implant immediately i think sha would be your best option because it's the least expensive we can cut the stay sutures now in fact sir, for that uh, just using uh, with both sleeves cut removed as a as a as a उटिंग so now urethral perforation if you are dilating the first side and it perforates where is the opening can you see it yes. okay. retract properly yeah 
Uh, then it's better to abandon and come back later. But if one side is dilated normally and then you perforate the second side, I would put an implant on one side and the other side, either you can do suprapubic or put in a catheter and it seals itself off and then you can put, go in for the other side a few weeks later. So again, here you would probably use the SHA initially and then the second time when you go around, decide what implant you want to use. Uh, if a glandular pexy, uh, the Journal of Urology has a technique where they kind of describe a U-step, uh, U-step, uh, U-shaped stitch. But what we have found is, which works for us, is we dissect the glands dorsally and take a vertical suture through the glands and through the tunica with 4-0 ethylonia. Close it. And we've done it very occasionally, and it has worked in those cases. Always hold closer because when you hold <coughs> here, and here you should be ready to step. Sometimes it might be loose. A step with the mosquito. If it is loose, not loose, no problem. Is it loose or tight? Okay, no problem. So now we finish one side, we'll close the other side, and then at the base of the penis, we'll take a stitch through the tunica implant, come back as a U, tunica implant, tunica, and tie it. So it will prevent it from migrating because we have forced our way into the tip here. And if there is a minor tear, we don't want that implant to six knots. <coughs> wash the whole area once with betadine, with uh, antibiotic wash, and then betadine on the skin quickly, one and the other. If you take betadine, whole area, and the mucus. Okay. Retractors in place, close the second side. Another retractor in place. And lazy. Okay. Closure doesn't count to decide who did the surgery. So, sister has been mopping. Normally, I try to avoid mopping because often our gauze pieces tend to leave little pieces of lint. So, I would prefer to irrigate rather than mop. Yes, he's taking a nice strong bite because the incision was planned well. He's far enough from the urethra. And this will be continuous. No need to interlock it because the implant as it is will keep the corpus stretched out. So in about 10 minutes, they will be closing here and we'll move on to the other case. Sure. So once we close the corpus, we'll have the fixation suture, then one or two layers of cremaster closed with continuous uh, three zero monocryl again or four zero monocryl, and then the skin with five zero rapid vicryl vertical mattress sutures. You guys use anything else for skin which you found better? Vineet, Raman, Sujata. No, sir, sir, works, sir. Hmm. no, sir, it's a very nice demonstration, sir. And we have learned many points from this, of course. And uh, every time we, uh, you know, we see you operate, there's always something to learn. New points are always there. And sir, congratulations to the young surgeons who've got, who've been fortunate to, you know, get this, the first penile implant done through, uh, you know, your side, sir. They were telling me they're going to the beach tonight to celebrate. <laughs> uh, right, so they should. We had a party there once, as I was telling Dr. Chawla, with Dr. Pratap many, many, many years ago, 25 years ago. And I must confess we were badly drunk, but we had a great time. Right, so now it, uh, indeed, sir, Mangalore, of course, is, has got some beautiful, different kind of beaches. And time should be spent there since once you're there. Uh, there's a question about, uh, for clarity, uh, for urethral perforation that you mentioned to, which, which happened later during the procedure, you would leave the unperforated uh, 
uh, implant in place. Yeah, so that we don't lose that corpus. Use a mosquito to help him. You can use the mosquito to hold the suture and also then to hold the short end so he finds it easier to see because okay. this is, yeah, make it nice and tight and then lift it up so you can hold the knot with the mosquito. So the people use, Sorry. people also use PDS for closure. I tried it, but I found it too stiff. So I've gone back to monocryl and this 3 monocryl has a very nice needle. So that's been my go-to suture. For peronies, I used to use monocryl, but I switched to ethylon 4.0 and that has been working very well. Sorry, there was a question. There are a lot of uh, patients that are having a malleable implant. Actually, any type of implant will ask this question about what kind of length and girth will be lost or preserved. What is your uh, advice that you give to? I always patients? tell patients that imagine 10% less girth, 10% less length. Now it varies. Some patients, 60% we found in one of our studies, have residual tumescence after the implant, especially younger men with venous leak. And those are the ones who are very happy because they have got the implant giving them stiffness and then they get a residual erection and it becomes really long, broad, strong. But if there's no residual erection, definitely the erection they get will be inferior to the best natural erection. And that message I repeat again and again and again, because I think pre-op counseling is very important. One of the DNB students did a study and the satisfaction rate seemed surprisingly high, almost cooked up high. But I think the reason why it was high was because of the counseling. We make our patients earn their implant. There will never be a patient who walks in today and has an implant day after. They will come, they will try tablet, they'll try injection, they'll be told about it. They'll be told to think about it, come back. Each time they come, we'll hold the penis, stretch it, tell them, see the length I'm showing you now. That is the length you will get. This is less than the length you had when you were 20 years old and all of that, then it helps because patients come with the thought that when I have an implant, doctor is going to create a masterpiece. The masterpiece concept has to be undermined. They have to understand that an implant doesn't produce a masterpiece. Inflatable comes close to it, but inflatables also have their own problems in terms of learning to inflate, in terms of sometimes device malfunction. And even with the inflatable in literature, the commonest cause of patient dissatisfaction is loss of length. I think whatever you do, either because of patient perception or because of actual loss of elasticity or because of the fact that the stretched, non-relaxed corpus cavernosum doesn't open up as much as the physiologically relaxed corpus cavernosum, there is some difference. And the way you can prove this for yourself is that while you're evaluating the patient, measure his best length, best girth after intracavernosal injection. Maybe if you're inducing a full erection, measure it then. Then measure the flaccid stretched length, and then measure the length you get with the implant. And if you do that over a series of patients, you'll be able to answer this for yourself that when do patients lose length and how much do they lose? Yeah, so Dr. Chawla is asking that in view of maintaining erectile ability, should you have cavernosal tissue? So that's why what we are doing is we are going under the tunica. So we are hoping that the cavernosal artery which runs in the tissue is not compromised. And it seems to work with inflatable implant. The majority will tell me that we inflate 50%, 70%, and we get some erection over and above that. And even with the non-inflatable, if they have had some erection before surgery, a two out of three will have retained erection. Uh, yeah, not very tightly fitting. Though, of course, with time, even when you have tightly fitting, the corpus tends to relax around it but not too tightly fitting, but not too loose either. If you use a, use a narrow implant, 
with space between the two, the patient will also come back saying that my penis is wobbling at the time of intercourse. So they should be in touch, in contact through the septum, but not so tight that it is leaving no room at all. Mosquito Good. to hold if it's fine. Good afternoon, Prof. I'm from Cambodia. Uh, I'm fellow with uh, Dr. Raman Tawa. I have one question about uh, penny lamp, this, uh, this uh, penny lamp plan. Uh, what we should uh, uh, follow up after we we, we do a uh, penile implant? At what follow up do we do penile implant after? So he's he's wanting to ask what how do you follow up now this case and what will be the life like? How long will this implant uh, be there for this patient? Oh, and the shine implant should last forever. Um, yes, sir. Follow up will be see a lot of my patients come from out of town and after three four days. They may not see me again, but they stay in touch telephonically. And they're all told that if you have pain or swelling, then you have to contact me urgently. Otherwise, they can just report telephonically. And then after three weeks, they can start masturbating. And after four to six weeks, they can start intercourse if all is well. Okay, now we're going to take the fixation stitch. So camera focus here. We'll try and go as deep down as possible. So you see the corpus here, right? So we want to go through the corpus and then come back and tie it here. So tunica, implant, tunica, tunica, implant, tunica. Same, same, same one. But put a mosquito on the end, it's short. Otherwise, it'll pull it out. And then you can take a new one because we'll use the new one for the inner cremastric layers. Okay, so I'm rotating it. So bite through the tunica. Guys, you can see it through the tunica, implant tunica. You should feel it going through the implant. But if you poke my finger, I'm going to whack you. So carefully. Yeah, put a retractor, he's scared. I'm more scared than him. Another retractor. Does it? No. So question is, will the uh, airport security get excited when this patient walks through? No, not at all, because there's nothing metallic. Even in the malleables, which have a metallic core, it doesn't seem to trigger off the alarm. So it's quite safe. It's a common question that they will ask. Here, of course, you came back for a U? Yes. No. You yes. came like this. You came back. Oh. Now you have to come back. So it's a U shape, holding it snugly in place. And when we do this, we have to ensure that the implant is in the best position. So if there's been a perforation with an alice, I will pull the implant into place and then place the suture. So for example, if there's a posterior perforation, we'll hold it with an alice and pull it into the glands. If there's a distal perforation, we'll pull it back almost to the corona and then place the suture. So it get locks, gets locked in the correct place. Is it bending? Yeah. You need not have too large a bite, it's difficult. Yeah, that's perfect. If any ties, he will need the suture to be held because this will be a loose knot. So if you could see, he's taken a kind of broad U, which when he ties will hold it in place. But the important thing is what I was discussing Dr. Chawla, that supposing I had a proximal perforation, then before closing the tunica, I would hold the implant with an alice, pull it, towards the glands, and while it is in that position, the assistant would place the suture, or other way around if the perforation was elsewhere. Here, because currently there's no perforation, this is just a prophylactic fixation, we are not bothering too much. So one more stitch there, and then I'll show you guys what to do. I'm going off for the other case now, and a very big thank you to uh, Vineet, Raman, and Sujata for their wonderful commentary and sharing of the session. And thank you to all those who've been watching at, I think, a relatively shorter notice. Okay, one stitch there, release. Release, yeah. Can you see this side here? Put in the retractors.
Yeah. Yeah, we can start then. We're moving to the other theater, which is a case of non-obstructive azospermia. He's been scheduled for microtisa, but we will be starting with an NT say, a needle TSA. If we don't get sperm on the NT say, we'll move to a mapping T say. And if we are unable to do the mapping or don't get sperm, then only we'll do the MT say. Many centers directly go in for an MT say, but I don't think that is correct. So I'll do what I think is correct. Vinit is going to be talking about that approach at the SIU in Istanbul later this year. Thank you, sir. It was really nice seeing you after so many years <clears throat> live. Rup Rupin. Yeah. Sanjay Kulkarni. Oh, Sanjay, I thought you had your own workshop. Why are you uh, wasting uh, your uh, time here? No, no, no. I, I'm watching you. You are my favorite hero. I want to tell everyone. I feel like I'm part of the DC comic world. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Rupin, I just want to tell every everybody who is listening that Rupin told me uh, fundamentals of life. That means eight hours of sleep and eight hours of work and eight hours for yourself and family. And that was long time ago. And more importantly, I am following the same. I go home by 4, 4.30. I come to hospital at 8 o'clock, go home at 4 o'clock. So I follow... Sanjay, everybody's inspiration. No. Sanjay, by the so... way, used to do magic, used to do golf. So there are many, <laughs> many things that he has done. Yeah. Yeah. He's found the perfect balance and the perfect way to impart I... the knowledge that he has perfected. I agree. It's yeah. a pleasure and a privilege to have him watching the surgery. Yeah, yeah. It went. Uh, Pankaj was supposed to be a faculty, but he was doing urethroplasty for me. And then we have a workshop going on. We have 10 urethroplasties lined up. Uh, six today, four tomorrow. Hmm? All right. So that, Which will finish in five hours. <laughs> no, no. But uh, Rupin, uh, yeah. you are an asset to your Rally Society of India, and we're proud. We are proud of what uh, you have been done. You have done to the andrology in India. Probably you are the earlier ones to go single speciality, apart from my guru, Mur Murli Kamath and others who started this uro-oncology. Yeah, yeah. huh? You agree Dr. with me? And then yeah. you and me probably at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And at that time, people used to think we were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I'm just going to show you all some inner layers to close. The more layers we get, the better. Some mosquitoes, please. So, yeah. There's a bleeder. Okay, you'll find the bleeder. Mosquito, please. So after you find the bleeder, you can see here is the buck's fascia. So two, three stitches through the buck's fascia. And then the cremaster, this layer as a transverse layer one, then maybe a second layer, and then vertical mattresses. Okay, so congratulations to I think we have lost the audio again. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, the second case is uh, of a couple. Uh, so the male being a bus conductor of 37 years old age who were trying to uh, uh, to have a baby but were not having uh, uh, there was no history of any coital difficulties and uh, he was a non-smoker uh, with no addictions and uh, he was evaluated uh, and found to have azospermia uh, the wife uh, she had a left side tubal corneal block and the husband was, after evaluation, was diagnosed to have a non-obstructive azospermia with the normal karyotype. They had failed one cycle ovulation induction followed by donor intrauterine insemination. And they were keen on getting a testicular biopsy.
the presenters, do we have other details uh, in terms of examination findings and hormone profile? Genetic study. So, uh, husband's uh, semen analysis showed uh, azospermia with the sure. reduced bilateral testicular volume and elevated FSH levels. The karyotyping was normal, sir. Right. Why was a trust done? Sir? Why did you do a trust? Anyways, let it be. So trust is not indicated in this patient. You had a small volume, uh, testicular volume, and you had a moderately elevated hormone profile. So this is non-obstructive as well. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Yes, you are audible. <laughs> You are on, you can be on, sir. One minute. You can be on. How can I don't work? I don't work. Bring your gloves. Just wait two minutes and bring something and come. Bring something. Uh, Chawla, sir, we can't hear uh, anything going on. Miss. Dr. Sujata? Uh, yes, sir. We couldn't hear yeah, anything. Yeah. In the... so this is being painted, draped, and uh, uh, within five minutes, we'll start the transmission. Okay? Okay, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I think he has made the presentation of this case. Okay.
हेलो 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 Uh, in the meanwhile, should we have some discussion about non-obstructive azuspermia till uh, the theater gets ready? Hello? 
Yeah, I think the theater is getting has got ready. Hello, ma'am. Ha, ah, hello. I just thought maybe we can just have something going on. Others. Uh, no, ma'am. We are just almost ready. Less than two minutes are there. Just. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. So. Ah, uh, do you yeah, did ah uh, did you didn't mention on the examination findings how was the epididymis and vas? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, uh, the vas was palpable, but it was the uh, the testis was uh, soft in consistency, and it was small in mm -hmm. size. The largest diameter being uh, three point six centimeters, like uh, small in size. Uh -huh. And the and how do you measure the testicular volume? Ma'am, uh, on the uh, ultrasound. Uh, this we, on ultrasound. Like, yeah, yeah, this is on ultrasound, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, What about the YQ micro deletion? Have you done a YQ micro deletion in this uh, gentleman, sir? Y chromosome micro deletion. Sir, your voice have is you... breaking, sir. No, in the karyotyping, what exactly have you done? Is the question asked? Have you done a uh, Y no, have chromosome? You Yeah, have you done YQ micro deletion, Y chromosome micro deletion? Have you tested for? Have you checked for them? Uh, y uh, chromosome micro deletion was negative, sir. It was done, but it was uh, not there. The okay. karyotyping uh, means uh, the uh, chromosome number and all uh, this Y uh, micro deletion was not there, sir. No, no, it's not not there. So let just let us just understand. When you are doing karyotyping, you are looking at numerical abnormalities, and mostly when you are looking at them, you are looking at whether there's Klinefelters or not. That's the commonest genetic abnormality that you'll find on karyotyping. With YQ micro deletion, that becomes more important in non-obstructive vasus permia because there are certain types on which uh, a, doing a retrieval procedure is unnecessary because there is practically you no know, chance of finding sperms. so which is why when we are doing retrieval procedures the yq micro deletion becomes a far more important investigation than a karyotyping per se uh, yes sir has this patient received any kind of uh, medical therapy any kind of stimulation before coming to this hospital sir he visited a local practitioner and there he was uh, advised this uh, uh, carnegie and tablet and but he has not taken it for less than 2 uh, weeks only and he presented to us directly so just for uh, one one week 10 days uh, he has taken sir uh, so basically you want to say that no other form of increase in the testosterone in the sense through uh, you know probably serums or in any way has been given to this patient right So I think what we are going to see today is a, as what we call a single session stage surgical sperm retrieval technique, where we are going through a, a needle testicular extraction or an NTZ, and if we don't find sperms, we will then go ahead to a mapping TZ, which is still a, not not a percutaneous. You deliver the testes, but still a a blind procedure without actually opening the tunica. and finally if nothing works then the micro tz clean with saline also sterilium okay we are on hi vinit yes sir i think you are ready sir I, now i think you've already taught them everything so i can silently proceed now so we are waiting to see you and see the prep, how, how you prep the patient and what's the so a lot of centers when they have a provisional diagnosis of noa will proceed directly to micro tc and uh, in fact we need you're going to have a debate in turkey 
with Kolpi and uh, Atis Kadiglu saying that only micro T cells should be shown, nothing else. However, if you look in literature, there's a 35% sperm retrieval by non microsurgical techniques, 50% retrieval when you do microsurgery. So it's only a 15, 15% gain. And that too in certain groups of patients. So keeping that in mind, what we have proposed is that you can have your cake and eat it too. Start with a simple technique. And if that doesn't show sperm, then proceed to microtisa at the same session. And for many patients, what this will mean is no cut, no stitch, just a simple non-invasive technique. Bring your trolleys, please. One wet gauze, please. And for many patients, that means a very simple technique. They walk in, walk out the same day. By the way, Vineet, yesterday I had a full microtis under pure local anesthesia. The guy came wow. after having tea and coffee. So I asked him why you didn't have my needly. And then since I was coming here, I didn't have time to do anything else. Just a wet swab, soaking wet swab. So we did the full thing, full micro T cell, YQC deletion. Did not get sperm, but we could do a very good detailed dissection just with a cord block. Sister, I need ring, ringer, all ringers. So when you have to irrigate the tissues in a T cell, micro T cell, uh, ringer is much better than cell line. Sister, I want a bowl with ringer. Is this ringer? What is this, sister? And okay, just give me MS now. And now take ringers, please. RL. So if you have to irrigate tissues, RL is far more tissue safe. So for the implant, we were using saline, but here we will use the RL. Both testing are good size. So there's nothing to choose from them. Well, but it is looking larger in, in volume. Can you please comment on that, sir? The ultrasound mentioned 8 ml. Dry gauze. Mm -hmm. Media in a... Where is the media? Lab, embryology lab, who is there? Yeah, I need media in a dish. Is there anybody from embryology? Sister Scalpen, you bad me. Scalpen, I want an 18 number scalpen, 10 ml syringe. I want 18 number. You have 20. So I usually use 18 number for the needle aspiration. Of late, 18 has not been available, so I've been using 20. So and one question. 20 uh, works. Sir, uh, the ultrasound mentioned 8 ml volume, but this is looking better. What is what is your assessment? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. I think ultrasound is the worst way to estimate testicular volume. Look, anybody can see it. Everybody can see it. This is anything other than an 8 ml testes. It's more like 20 ml. I don't know how they do it. The ultrasound people claim they are the most accurate, but again and again and again, I find that their reports are completely nonsense. So I don't rely on ultrasound. I would rely on a Prader orchidometer. So I'm glad you asked that question. It's a good size testes, but a flabby epididymis. So even though the testes is good size, the flabby epididymis tells us that most probably it is non-obstructive. My follow-up comment on the YQ microdeletion uh, more relevant with this normal volume rather than a small volume testes. Correct. Correct. With this test is normally we don't find a karyotypic abnormality, but if at all we find something, it's a YQC. But let me just get things sorted out here. What scalpin do we have, sister? Sister, please answer me. What scalpin do we have? Okay, do we have 20 anywhere or we don't have 20? 20 not there, so only 20 do we have. Okay, do we have a 10 ml syringe? Yeah, give me the 10 ml syringe, please. Give, okay, do we have micro forceps? Keep two micro forceps here and a mosquito. Where is the media in a dish? I need media in a dish. Please put the dish in the kidney tray. Yeah. 
Do you have short forceps or you have only long ones? Show me. Yeah, we'll use these. Okay, do we have media, please? Where is the embryologist? We're going to send the sample. Look, sure, but I need a dish with media. Dish, dish, we need a dish for sending a sample. There'll be a sterile dish in which we send the tissue. How do you send the tissue to them? In the, in the tube? No, no, the tube has too much media. No, but when you pull out tissue, you must be putting it in a dish, a, a well, a small well dish. Yeah, the round well dish. No, but we can't send them the tissue unless we have the well dish, because the tissue goes in the well. Now, what have you brought? Show me. No, not that. Because the tissue will always go in the well dish to the lab. So there's a delay because we're looking for a dish to send the tissue in. <clears throat> we're going to do a needle biopsy, but with the 22 gauge, I'm not sure what we'll get. But we'll just do it to demonstrate, and then we'll proceed to the next step. So Vinith, you were asking something about YQC or that has been answered? No, sir. You answered the volume and the type of test. There were some questions which I think are important to answer because uh, these tend to be... So, so one uh, delegate has asked uh, whether you would do a CFTR test in this. And uh, another uh, question on details of the karyotyping report. So... And this patient had also, plus, uh, which which I had already mentioned, uh, is not indicated to, to be done in this patient. Okay, since we don't have a dish, we'll proceed with the sterile jar. Where is that sterile beaker? Uh, take the sterile beaker, please. Yeah. Yeah, open, take it, give it. Yeah. Now, in give the lid. Let's put some media in the lid, please. So, is this visible? I'm not seeing what is seen. Can you see the lid here? Uh, we can see the lid, sir. Yeah, I'm going to take some media in that. That is not the way it is done. You should have actually a gamete-friendly dish. But enough, enough, enough. But we don't have that, so we've taken some media in this. I'm now going to aspirate the fluid in the syringe. Connect the scalpel, please. So Dr. Deepak Gupta has also put a message that you will get tissue with 22, but the embryologist will have a tough time. You will get tissue? But okay, so there was a stool to sit. So now what we've done is we've wiped the skin clean of the betadine. Now I'm going to flush media, press the syringe. We're going to flush media onto the skin so that the skin press fully. Press, 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 yeah. So that the skin is now covered by media. So the tissue that comes out will be in touch with the skin. Now this is not an FNAC. We're actually trying to do a proper biopsy. So it is a TSA procedure not a TSA procedure, though I don't know what we'll get here. So we've entered the testy suction. We're applying suction with a 10 ml syringe. Pull all the way to the top, yeah. 
So now the 10 ml syringe has applied suction and now the needle will go in and out. We are not macerating the testes. I'm not going in multiple directions. We are not trying to macerate and aspirate. We're trying to pull a tubule of tissue into the needle. Therefore, I'm going in and out a few times. There may be some fluid in the tubing. That fluid constitutes a TSA sample, and the tissue that we will get will constitute a TSA sample. So having made a few passes, I'm now going to clamp the tubing so that release, yeah, remove the syringe, take air in it, fill it up with air, and then reconnect. This is cautery. Okay, leave it there. I need a stool to sit. Okay, keep it down. Take the two forceps. So now we've got the suction, we've clamped. Now as I pull out the needle, you spill the media. Okay, keep that there. Is there media inside? Take a little more media in it. A little more media. Now when the needle comes out, you'll see hopefully a core of seminiferous tubules all that and grasp it first with one forceps, then with the second forceps. So this is, yeah, hold and pull first with one, then with the other. So we've got a, some tissue, a very thin sliver because the needle is small, pull from the testes. Okay, so we've got a little bit on the forceps. Bring the, bring the lid here, bring the lid. Yeah, dip the forceps in it. So we are scraping off the tissue that we pulled out, which wasn't very impressive, but we've got a tubule. And then when we flush the needle, there'll be more tissue. Does it come? Okay. And now remove the clamp and flush. Flush with pressure. Press it. Is the camera seeing this? Okay. Flush. Is there any tissue in there? Yeah, just make sure it's all in the media and we'll do one more so that they have more tissue to examine. So this technique we call NTC, needle TC, aspirate, or NAB, needle aspiration biopsy. So this is an actual biopsy. We're not concerned with the fine needle aspirate. We're not looking at cytology. The lab will be getting tissue they will dissect the tubules to release the sperm within the tubules. And those sperm will be, that tissue will be examined to look for sperm. Clamp, please. So we've made five or six passes. Sometimes we may rotate to cut the tissue. Re release it first. Release it. The reason why you release is if it doesn't go down, I know there wasn't enough pressure. Now that it has gone down, we know there was pressure. Now disconnect, take care, and reconnect. Okay, now bring the forceps. So now again, we're going to grab the tissue as it comes out of the testes. First with one, pull, pull, pull. Now with the second, from the testes, pull slowly, not too much, otherwise it'll break. It broke. Okay, done. Now pull it out of the needle. Now there's a long piece in the needle, which hopefully you could see. Now we're putting that in media. So ideally, this should be going in a sterile central well dish, since we don't have that way using the lid of a urine collection jar. And syringe, flush, please. So now we are flushing so that any other tissue left in the needle will go. And we'll do one last one, aspirate. And if they've got sperm in this procedure is over, if not, we'll proceed to the next step. So while we give them five minutes to examine, we'll prepare for the next step. In about one in three cases, this is all that is required, except that you'd use a 20 or an 18 gauge needle and you do a four quadrant biopsy, upper, lower, medial and lateral.
We've made our five passes. We've clamped the tubing. We're disconnecting the syringe, filling it with air, fill the syringe with air so that we can use it to flush the tubing. Then we reconnect the syringe. While he's doing that, I make one or two more passes of the needle. And now we come out slowly. The secret here is to stretch the skin very tightly over the testes so that there is no space between the skin and the tunica. If there's space, the tissue will get trapped between the two and you will not get tissue. Now, we are, you can see we're pulling out tissue more and more. We're actually unraveling a seminiferous tubule out of the testes. We got a good piece this time. And now we will flush the tubing for extra tissue. Now, there was something more that came out. Now, can we just put all the tissue into one corner and then, sister, take the kidney tray? Yeah. So we will put this in the kidney tray and send it to the lab. They will now dissect this tissue to check for sperm. Meanwhile, we will get prepared. Keep it here. Yeah. Fine. Who is taking this? Please take it to the embryologist. Where is the embryologist sitting? No, how far from here? Okay, so, yeah. Okay, somebody take the kidney tray. No, no just pick up the kidney tray, sister. No, no need for anything, just take the kidney tray. Huh? Now put it in that and send it to the lab. Okay, now most important, if you've seen all the while, my one hand is continuing to stretch the skin over the testes, which will prevent any bleeding. And now while we are waiting for the lab to give us feedback, we continue to maintain pressure for five minutes because the only risk of this procedure is hematoma. So you must give a minimum five, preferably 10 minutes of pressure. During that time, we will get set for the next step. Keep this away. And now, can we bring the microscope in? And I need a stool to sit and connect the bipolar cautery. Yeah. So I need the bipolar at the right hand. So connect it here. Is the cautery connected? Okay, suction we won't need. And then... Yeah, light Sir. we can move. Good question. Can we ask some questions? Yeah. So, uh, what is your sequence of doing the NTZ or any preferred uh, site on the testes? How many numbers and do you do unilateral or on both sides? Sorry, in which case? Sir, what is your preference of uh, the sequence of biopsy? Do you do particular poles or uh, particular sites on the uh, testes? Preferred uh, so we location. Four, we can do up to four biopsies because too many biopsies will damage the testes. So upper pole, lower pole, medial, and lateral. Okay. And both sides? And, uh, just one minute. I'm making some adjustments. Can we move the lights away and move the microscope in? And now we will use the microscope, not the external camera. We can move the lights away. Can we bring the microscope in? We need the microscope in. I think that must be my sight. Yeah. So you'll have to turn it around. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And that is your sight. You're comfortable. Okay, fine. Perfect. In a moment, I'll release this and then we'll adjust it. Uh, the stool is still too low. Can we either uh, getting another stool? Yeah. Um, sister, we'll need a knife, mosquitoes, and the height up this much height I need. Sure. Uh, 15 number blade is ready. And now for sending the tissue.
Do you have another bowl like this? Dry bowl in which you have not taken anything? Or take a fresh bowl. Thank you. Uh, we'll manage. We'll lower the table a little. Uh, can you push the stool in, please? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Vinit, you were asking something? No, sir. The last part was unilateral or both sides? Would you do the biopsy? Oh, if you get sperm on one side, you don't go to the other side. Because every TSA procedure, even though it looks harmless, will compromise sperm production to some degree. So I've had cases where I did TSA, found sperm the first time, and two months later, we didn't find sperm. So we normally tell people that you need to wait at least three months, at least three, preferably six, before repeating the TSA on the same side. So if you get sperm on one side, you should leave the other side for the next time. Sister, may I take my glasses, please? Yeah, take, take them out. Yeah, you can keep them here. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now we're just bringing the microscope in place, which is the release button. Okay. Now, is the microscope seen? The microscope image? Okay, no, but we need to focus it. Is there a button to press for focusing with the laser? Now that is the release button. Don't press that. Can we lower the table a little more? Okay, thank you. Still not in focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't touch it. So we are seeing the surface image, uh, not through the microscope. Okay. Can you show them the microscopic image now? Got it now, sir. Ah, we can see it now. Sir. Okay, now it's in focus for me. Is it in focus for you? Yes, sir. Yeah, the drop of blood is seen well? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's in focus. Now let's see if we magnify what happens. Now? Yeah, focus. Sir. This is clear. I think we may use slightly lower focus. This should be clear right now. Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And sister, take a 20 number needle. And you, did you get a bowl, an empty bowl, clean bowl, empty clean bowl? Clean bowl in which you've never put anything. Was anything in this? Nothing. Completely dry? Okay. So, so we'll need media in this, and we're going to put all the tissue in that. Now, where's the syringe with ringer? Are you comfortable? Are you able to see? Do you want to sit? Because if you sit, you'll be able to help better. If you're standing, it'll be difficult for you. Is that ringer? Connect with the needle and break the needle tip. 
Because if you're standing, you won't have control over your hands. Yeah. Put any needle and break it. Yeah. Thank you. So we need the media. Media is there. Ah, so later on, we'll put dishes have come. And ah, then we'll use the dish. I was using this because we didn't have the dish. Ah, can you show me the dish? Yeah, that is perfect. So uh, take, give me the kidney tray, sister. Uh, it's dry. Okay, is the media in the dish? I put media and then put the dish in the kidney tray. And we won't touch inside, sister, because inside will be unsterile. Let them put media in the dish and then put the dish in the kidney tray. And uh, can we check with the pathologist whether they found anything in the first? Uh... No, but he has to inform us. He will inform you, sure. Very good. So keep that, keep that there. Keep it here. I'll be handing you tissue with the forceps. You have to dip it in this and put it in that, but don't touch the dish because that is unsterile. We're just awaiting the result of the initial aspirate, but meanwhile, we'll start the next step, which is the mapping. Skin knife, please. So you will take irrigation in your hand. Here is bipolar. So now we'll open the scrotum. Can you see under through the microscope? Vineet, is it visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Sir. Yes, sister. Irrigate, please. Sir, question here, longitudinal transition versus answers in... Sorry, what is the question? Incision preference, sir. Uh, now, some people do both sides through a single incision, which may then be on the septum or transverse. I personally prefer separate incisions, so I take a vertical incision on the mid scrotum. Right, sir. Knife pins. The reason why I prefer separate incision is because once we finish one side while doing the second side, the assistant continues to maintain pressure on the first testes, which plays a very important hemostatic role. Right. Okay, so we have the testes out. Two mosquitoes, please. One more, hold it with the mosquito. Scissors, please. One mop ready to isolate. So the first step that we did was the needle tisa. Normally we would wait for the result, but we're going ahead at least with the mapping. We may decide whether or not to do a formal micro tisa based on what we see. Here we are using a fine tipped or a pediatric bipolar. Sack is unusually thick. Okay, take out the mosquito, mop please, one mop. Do you have a mop, sister? Now we can see the size is about 15 ml and a little soft. And the epididymis is quite collapsed. 
So definitely, do you have a mop? Mop. Big mop, do you have? Mm -hmm. Give, give. Yeah, so we're just isolating the skin from the testes. Now we're going to do what is known as a therapeutic mapping by the SSC. Give me the 20 gauge needle, which I'd asked for. I'd asked for a 20 gauge needle, no, sister. You've not taken it. So this forceps has a tooth, so that is no good. So that we don't want. So do you have non tooth forceps? Okay, this is got serrations. So what will happen is the tissue will stick to this. So we'll use it because we don't have anything else, but this is not the right one. You should have non serrated forceps. Can you all see that? So we need more. We need three forceps. Give me a 20 gauge needle, please. 20. Yeah, this is 20. 20 gauge. This is not 20. 20 is usually yellow. What number needle is this? What needle have you given, sister? Sister, what needle? What needle is this? No, the, no, no. Where is the needle? I don't want a syringe. Do you have a needle? Okay, if you don't have a needle, don't worry. So now to do the needle, SSTT say, see, these are our puncture points. Can you see them? They're sealed off completely. Here is a little tissue still popping out. So we can draw out a little more tissue from there. The tubule looks fairly good. I'll zoom in and show you. Sister, don't worry about the needle now. That's over and done with. Do you have more forceps? Okay. Sister, take this. Can you put it in that, please? Into that. So this is a forceps that you absolutely don't want. It's of no use at all. Give me those long forceps which you had. Not... Uh, this is again no good. You had the micro forceps, long micro forceps. Give those. So what we do in the mapping is that you puncture in an avascular area. And it turns out to be vascular, which it shouldn't have. Stretch the opening a little. And then you should see, okay, there's a vessel right there. There's no tubule that we'll have to burn, but otherwise you should have had a tubule popping out. But this one will burn. Again, this is not a true microbipolar. Ideally, you should have a finer tip forceps. So, what uh, magnification are you at currently? What? Magnification? This, uh, I don't know really. Let me zoom in and out and see. I just took something convenient. So this is about, now this is about four times what you'll see with a loop. So we are at about eight times just now. The full magnification on this will be 20 times. No, it's 12 into something, so it is a multiplication. But for, okay, give the forceps. So now you made a puncture, it's avascular. Stretch it with a forceps and you'll see a tubule popping out. Uh, slowly, if it's gelatinous, you don't take more. But if it's a good tubule, you'll be able to unravel a sizable part. Here you can see the tissue is quite fibrous, see, not coming out. But then this technique may not work well. But you've got a little tubule, put it into that. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so the needle has spread, they've not seen sperm. We'll see if we are able to get good tissue with the mapping. If we do, then we may take 20 mapping biopsies all over. If you don't get good tissue, then we'll proceed to the micro T cell. So again, I'm finding an avascular area. Forceps, please. Touch the puncture point. So in some cases, this is enough. And as you can see, this is very atraumatic because there's no cut, no stitch, and usually no bleeding. So there's no devascularization. But in this case, you can see the tissue is very unhealthy. In a good case, when you pull a tubule like this, a whole tubule should unravel out of the testes. Here, this is not working. So I'm going to proceed to a micro T cell. Uh, so for the micro T cell, uh, some people take a longitudinal cut, but actually the transverse is more anatomical. So we'll take a transverse cut through the midline to bivalve the testes. You can do that with 11 number blade, but here, since I already have puncture points, I'll just join the join the puncture points together. Initially, you make a partial incision, and we have to do hemostasis. So for this, you can see our forceps is a little too big. Ideally, we should have finer tip. Okay. The tissue is very uniform, if you can see. This would be typical of either certainly or maturation arrest. There is no variation. In such a case, if the first few biopsies don't show anything, usually I have not seen with more biopsies. But we are now increasing the magnification. Can you appreciate? Very small tubules and completely uniform pattern. Microtis is most useful when there is a varied pattern, some areas of fibrosis, some areas of atrophy, and some which are normal. In this situation, there's no visual distinguishing factor between one area and another area. What is the cautery setting? I make it 10, please. Are you able to appreciate the tubules? So now, whatever looks relatively better forceps is what we will pick up. Bigger one. Which look opaque and large. Yeah, opaque and large. So here they are more or less all similar. There's not much to choose. The actual ones that containing sperm would be about twice this diameter. This is not a good case. And if you don't find sperm, we would usually send a biopsy. So, do we have Boyne's fluid? Uh, see this tubule, very thin. I'm taking a few random biopsies, but there's nothing that has impressed me. So, the first step is you open the tunica and inspect the surface. Put it in that, put the kidney tray down. Now hold the forceps, dip it in that. We can give them a light here. So meanwhile, outside, they're dipping the forceps in media and stripping off the sperm. Have you reduced cautery? Okay, so now we can burn the vessel, which is here. Take a forceps in your hand so that you can also provide counter. Just pull it like that with your right hand, do this way.
So you can see that even when we make a small opening, there are vessels that need to be burnt and that will compromise the vascularity of some parts of the testes. So we've inspected the surface. There's nothing very impressive. So we'll extend further. Sometimes if you're lucky, you may see something right away and the patient doesn't need more dissection. So we've not got sperm in the needle. With the mapping, we didn't get much tissue. What I'm seeing on the surface is unimpressive, but we're taking a few random biopsies to send to the lab person so he doesn't fall asleep. Put that in the dish, then then somebody will yeah, pick up the dish, send it to the lab and put a new dish in the tray. So one minute, one minute. Can uh, somebody let somebody pick up the dish? Sister, pick up the dish. Yeah, only the dish. Yeah, send it to the lab and put a new dish with media in the kidney tray. Scissors to me. So now we are going to extend the opening. So part phase one, next part is to make a bigger incision. And again, we'll inspect the surface. So this incision has to be big enough to bivalve the testes. Okay, quite a long incision. Maybe need a little more to be able to bivalve it properly. Again, we look for any bleeders. Now let's inspect the new part that we've opened up. So we finished one micro TESA sample from the surface. But if you can appreciate, there's nothing impressive here. Very thin tubules. Can you see that? Very, very thin, atretic. This is because we coagulated here. One. Which one? Here? Uh, quite fibrous, actually. But sister, put that in media. Do not pick up the kidney tray. See what he's doing. Hold the, for hold the forceps. Dip it in that. Yeah. And no need to pick up the kidney tray. So, Vinit, is the image clear? Here you see yeah, something. You can see some tubules which look different. Uh, is that? Yeah. That we are picking up. I'm not sure whether it's different or whether I coagulated there. When you coagulate also the appearance changes, but definitely it looked different. We picked it up. All the rest looks very uniform. All these are very small, very small. These ones. Let's see. Yeah, actually, you can see it's quite tiny. Can you see this? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
but nothing that I would say will have sperm needs to be larger. Don't irrigate when I'm burning because the bipolar gets short circuit. Now irrigate. Okay, now we come to the second part. Mosquito, please. Which is the first bivalving. So step one was inspect the surface. Step two is to bivalve. When we bivalve, we don't want the parenchyma to separate from the tunica. So we hold some of the parenchyma with the tunica. One more mosquito. And again on the opposite side, we'll hold parenchyma and tunica. And now when I bivalve it, I will put pressure on the parenchyma. You don't want the parenchyma to protrude and separate from the tunica. That will cause a subtunical plexus bleed. So we split it open. And as you split open, we inspect the cut surface. So that is level two. So I have split partially and I'm inspecting the cut surface for anything that may reveal itself. Anybody sees anything that looks promising, you can yell. These are the lobules. And see, these are the vessels. They will all radiate from the hilum. So when you follow this approach, we will reach the hilum and we will dissect between the lobules. On the cut surface, so far, nothing. Let's see this side. Oh, very tiny, very atrophic. I think it will be certainly looking at the tubules. Nothing here, so we divide further. So once again, my thumb applies pressure and I split the parenchyma. And this goes till we reach the hilum. Maybe I'm also needing to split the tunica a little so that we can buy well full V. Now, as we reach the hilum, I'll zoom out to show you the hilum. And you appreciate how it is opening like a flower and you can see all the lobules radiating out from here. This is a vessel, this is a vessel, this is a vessel, here is a vessel. All these are radiating out from the hilum. And between each of these, parallel to the vessels, we will dissect deeper. We need to go a little further to reach the hilum. You see the big vessel here. And now notice that the tunica and the parenchyma have not separated. They are intact. Now I will put my finger and evert the parenchyma, and the dissection will now proceed to level three, which is I will go through the parenchyma to reach the tunica. Is that clear? So that we are not causing the parenchyma to pop out. If you squeeze like this and it comes out of the tunica, there's a subtunical plexus which will bleed. So now we will increase the magnification and start our dissection lobule by lobule. Mosquito, as a marker, optionally you can place one mosquito at the corner here and one mosquito at the corner. Okay. 
here. So now we have our segments. This is the first segment from from this mosquito to this mosquito, and the second segment from there. We'll keep one gauze here to reduce oozing. And now we will increase our magnification. I use something like 20. And now we start going deeper. You can see this, all very, very tiny, terrible. And now going parallel to the vessel, we go to a deeper tissue. Again, all the same. A very, very bad situation. And we go deeper. So I'm going through the parenchyma, parallel to the blood vessel, to approach the tunica. You can also look, and if you see something, you can pick it up. See these tubules here, very tiny. Can you see them? Very, very tiny. So, so the same. Not... Sorry? So point here, when, when you actually looked at the uh, volume of the testes and yeah. the initial, when you open up, you pretty much got an idea that you will be looking at similar tubules. Yeah. So here the epididymis was also a clue. So I'm just taking some random biopsies, which will definitely not, not have sperm, but we need to give the embryologist something. But so far, all that we have seen, just is there some tissue on this. Make sure there's no tissue on the forceps. You can see a big vessel radiating from the hilum. So you don't damage the vessel, you dissect parallel to it. That way we try to minimize the vascular damage. I'm going parallel and going deeper. Are you at full magnification, sir? I could increase a little, I'll see. I can go to this. But at that, it's becoming quite dull. And uh, I don't need that much. This much is enough, which gives me a wider field. And I can still differentiate because of this magnification, I'm seeing this size very clearly. And what I'm looking for is something which is two times this size. There's a bleeder there, so we burn that. So, as you will see, I limit my cautery. I've seen Peter Schlegel operate. He is very generous in his use of cautery. I think that is not required and not good. So we've come now, you can see the tunica here. So that's the limit of our dissection. So now we come to the second quadrant between the second and the third mosquito. So again, notice my finger is protruding the tissue out. And then from the surface, we are working our way to the parenchyma, through the parenchyma to the tunica. Now the question will arise, if we don't find sperm here, should we do the other side? Given the completely homogeneous picture here, I would not really bother. At the most, I may do some needle biopsies from the other side, but I think the microtisa would not help. So you can see always parallel to the blood vessels and going layer by layer deeper. Each time we dissect, we pause and inspect what we have dissected. What we are seeing is terrible. 
really, really tiny tubule. So we need any suggestions? So this seems to be very homogeneous. So uh, again, the point to reiterate with normal volume testes and non-obstructive, uh, we are finding a more uh, homogeneous uh, testes. And the use, utility and usefulness of doing uh, percutaneous uh, tissue aspiration or mapping, because we tend to uh, go less into the tunical or subtunical uh, tubules when we do a micro uh, we, we, that's the actually the end point of where our dissection will reach so so the surface uh, aspirations help there i think we've lost your voice again sir you lost my voice no, 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 we gave you got it. Now, can you hear and see? Yes, sir. Big vessel here. You don't want to damage it. So that is the advantage of this transfer sensation. You land up right at the hilum and you can see all these big vessels and avoid damaging them. If your magnification is very, very high, so your depth of field becomes very less. So you're almost struggling with focus. That's why slightly less than maximum gives a better depth of field while not compromising your ability to identify the best tubule. So the patient game, little by little, layer by layer, segment by segment, making your way deeper. And each time, Paul. So, Pinsir, when we, uh, you know, when we take those random biopsies, uh, for example, in this case, we are able to see that, you know, the chances are bleak. Most likely, if it's an SOS, maybe 20%, 30% chance of finding some sperms, but we do have micro where we just get only one sperm in just one sample. So, sir, how do you decide yeah. how many biopsies you need to take randomly? The ones which you know they may not be the best, but you still are taking them with hoping against hope that you know let, let us so, do our best for this patient. When we are doing random biopsy, it is an active thing with the lab. We'll take some biopsy, send it to them. Yes, sir. And then, yes, sir. And while we are doing more, they keep on looking at that. Right, sir. Right, sir. So, sir, so in that case, now, in a normal good volume test, is typically what is the number that you usually hit by chance while you are, you know, trying to figure so I out. I would wind up probably taking 30, 40 biopsies. 30, 40. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, but these are like tiny biopsies. See, if I take right, this. Just one one tubes, right, sir. Yeah, that the 30, 40 biopsies will amount to very little in terms of total volume. Or the volume, right, sir. To just ensure a very wide sampling of the testing. Right. So the and so unfortunately, the focus can be anywhere. It can be, you know, just one tubule having one, yeah. you know, sometimes. Which then could be random because it's very interesting. If you go back to Peter Schlegel's original paper on microtisa, where he did both conventional biopsy and micro TISA on the same testes. There was one case in his series of about 50 where he didn't find sperm in micro TISA and he found it in the random biopsy, right. which is just a matter of chance. Matter the of chance. message there is that if there is no visual heterogeneity, like here everything is homogeneous, then truly speaking, micro TISA has no advantage over random biopsies. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing that is visually guiding you to say mm -hmm. this area is better than that area. Right, sir. So that is why if I had to do the other side, it would be random and cause less trauma to the testes. Because whatever literature says, this is not atraumatic. So much dissection 
some coagulation mm. suturing it together is bound to cause fibrosis in this parenchyma so, so anybody who has done a microtest and gone back again uh, you know to yeah it's always it. severely fibrosed yes it's, it's fact, usually you can't do anything and no, what will happen is often when I've gone back, I will say, okay, here was microtis and that area is totally fibrous. Mm -hmm. Nearby will be an area which is not fibrous, which is probably not explored. You can actually distinguish, saying, oh, this is operated, this is unoperated, or explored and this is not explored. But it's a severe fibrosis and Peter Schlegel doesn't talk about it, but I first met him in the early 80s, when he had just started Microtisa, and uh, Peter Chen, no, the other guy, uh, the Chinese, Dr. Jim, uh, he was Dr. running his lab, he showed me a histopath picture of the testes after Microtisa with extensive fibrosis. Now, of course, they hide that, they don't show it, but it's something that they recognized even then. But now I'm feeling tunica through the tissue, which tells me that I've gone deep enough. So now we will rotate it. So I'll zoom out to show you the rotation. So we've explored this side, one, two, and three. I remove the two corners. I push the tissue back in. So notice how it's anatomical. Like a flower, it has opened out. The tissue is not shredded into pieces. Little by little, if you see, it is all opened out deeper and deeper like that. So that is how the dissection should be. And it is not separated from the tunica. Now I push all of it back in and rotate 180 degrees so that the other pole will now rest upon my finger. And once again, we can put the mosquito, marking mosquito, now at the corner again here. And the corner here. So now this will be my two segments. First this segment, then that segment. And again, we'll be spreading it open like this, parallel to the various blood vessels. So this, was the, this side we have explored, now this side. So again, we'll increase the magnification. Still, you can recognize the tubules properly. See, you can see them very well now. You can see them as small tubules. And you can see the vessel radiating out. So we start separating the lobule. This time I'll be using 5-0 proline. If you have different proline, the one which I like, Code number is 881, 881, 50 proline, single arm needle. So again, we are pulling the lobule open. Can I see the needle, please, what you have? Uh, see, you can see there's Nothing here, just thin atrophic tubules. Can you see that? Terrible. Is Boyne's fluid ready? We'll take one biopsy. Biopsy serves two purposes. It allows you to counsel the patient as to why we didn't find sperm, which is a very important step. And two, it rules out any intratubular germ cell neoplasia. So give me a micro scissors, please. So it even keeps the embryologist in check, you know, that we are going to send it for biopsy. And if a sperm is found yeah. in the biopsy, then you had the time of your life. Yeah. 
it's a very tricky thing actually yeah, because uh, the pathologist will have a different uh, outlook to seeing a, a sperm versus a, a embryologist and at times we've had issues with that because uh, something which may not be a mature sperm is still recognized on a fixed biopsy as a sperm and uh, and we've had uh, you know very contrasting differences normal spermatogenesis versus uh, no no sperm forceps hold this lightly with a micro forceps like don't crush it i just hold it lightly just to keep a mosquito ready mosquito put this put it on the mosquito hold hold the forceps put it on the mosquito binds fluid upside down in keep it here on the tip 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 put it in the binds fluid mm, don't take it on the trolley binds fluid is very bad for sperm keep it far away so that biopsy will go and we will continue our dissection we can send this dish take another dish and see very centivial what i have found in general is that if there is acquired damage orchitis torsion undescended testes there the pattern is heterogeneous and microtisa has a good chance where it seems to be congenital with no acquired trauma there it tends to be more homogeneous and microtisa has less of an advantage on okay thank you so far no sperm are seen okay notice again parallel to the vessel we are separating the lobule and as you can see whether it is near the vessel or far from the vessel there is no difference so some people claim that there is better chance where there is more vascularity uh, we have not seen that during microtis okay we will move to the second half between the second and third mosquitoes here is the vessel so we are going parallel pulling the lobule open from the hilum to the tip and then pausing to inspect again pulling it open the large bleeder pops up we burn it minor bleeders we don't worry what was his fsh this patient naran so see it's interesting a normal fsh uh, what is the range in your lab ranges so it was above normal okay so 9.6 could be normal in some labs where the range is 1 to 15 but in this lab the range is 1 to 7 so here fsh was above normal 
very important when looking at FSH to know the range of the lab. So anybody wants to go have lunch, come back in 15 minutes because then you will see how the closure is done, which is important. There's a question about counseling a patient before micro TZ. What are the points to be told to the patient? One thing is you tell him that there's a 20-30% chance. Second, if his testosterone is low to start with, and it's a small test, he's warn him that he may have hypogonadism and may require testicular supplementation. And of course, third warn him about other complications that could be pain. Pain is very variable. Some people have had pain for up to a month. Some people the next day, they're happy and ready to go. So you can see this is tunica here. I'll show you. Can you see that tunica? So that's how I know I've completed the dissection. We've gone through the parenchyma to the tunica. So nowadays, labs have become better at freezing rare sperm, especially with the onset of vitrification. Therefore, often we will tell the patient that you need not have your wife stimulated. We will first do a trial, and if you find sperm, we will freeze it, and then your wife can be stimulated. That is often more acceptable to the couple because it avoids a lot of expense related to the IVF. That's the hilum. Can you see it? Seen beautifully. All the vessels radiating out from the hilum to the periphery, we explore the whole parenchyma. So though this is a negative exploration, anatomically it has been a good, clear demonstration of what you are trying to achieve. I can feel the tunica here, so I know I've completed my exploration. If I zoom out, You can see once again that this whole side has been spread open like a flower, but it is not shredded. It's open, see that? Parallel to the vessels. So we can release the two corners, untwist it. So now we do a final look where we do hemostasis and see whether any other tubule has popped out. Okay, parenchyma is nicely within the tunica. Now, the first time you do a micro tisa, you'll always worry, how on earth will I close this testes? But as you see, or rather as you shall see, done properly, it's a very easy thing to do. Forceps. Very tiny tubules. In the operative notes, we can mention uniform pattern of very thin tubules. Entire test is explored. Random biopsy is taken. No sperm seen. One biopsy sent for histopath. So there is no bleeder, but there is no tubule jumping up saying, pick me, pick me.
all very thin. I'm just giving some work to sister, otherwise she's getting bored. And this is the hilum. I would prefer not to coagulate here because here are the main vessels. So let's see what we have. No active user, so we don't coagulate. Okay, so I'm going to close now. We can send that last dish. Is there anything in it? Okay, bring the proline, please. Mosquito. And now I'll show you how I close usually. When we'll hold the corner and we'll take two interrupted sutures, which will keep the testes from. forming a concertina effect. Take the proline. Yeah. Mm. This is double arm. Do you have a single arm? Only double arm you have. Okay, give it. So the proline I prefer is a slightly longer needle. This one is a short needle. It'll be a little more difficult to use it because it'll tend to come out. But anyway. So cut it in the middle sister and put it on a regular needle holder, not a micro needle holder, regular needle holder, and then give the fine tooth forceps which you had. So start by taking one stitch from here to here. Okay, from here to here. Give him the proline. Yeah, you cut it in the middle, cut it in the middle. This is a double arm, we don't need double arm. In the middle, middle, middle. Where's the needle? Far away? Okay, cut it here somewhere. Cut it here, don't keep it very long here. Yeah, cut it there. Put a mosquito on the end, put a mosquito on the end. I used to use six zero, but several times it broke in a continuous suture that can be very frustrating. Five zero seems to be the best compromise between uh, strength and fineness. Okay, so place your first suture from here to here. From here. Now use the forceps, give them the tooth forceps. Now from here, pick up the tunica. Yeah, right here, close to the edge, closer to, closer to the edge. And no, don't pull it out. See the opposite point is, yeah, hold it there. I'll remove the mosquito. Yeah, right where the mosquito is. But sure, that's too thick a bite, much smaller, much smaller, much smaller. Yeah, perfect. And now tie that. Bring the mosquito in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Yeah, pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, hold it perfect. Very good, sister. Now release the mosquito. Yeah, time. Don't keep the short end too long. Keep it short. The short end should be shorter, much shorter, much shorter. Let the not pull the long end. Don't pull the, leave the short end. Leave the short end. Pull the long end, pull. Mm -hmm. Which is the short end, this one? Okay, then make that shorter. It's too long. Yeah, let it come, come, come. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, tie now. Yeah, now complete your tying. 
you will see how these three interrupted sutures make it very easy to then close the testes and it will prevent a concertina effect. Mosquito, please. Take a scissors in your hand, sister. Six knots. Six knots. Okay, very good. No, separate. Cut the long one. Okay. Now, you place one more suture. I hold the other corner. We push the testes back. Forceps, please. Plain, give me the plain forceps, not micro, plain. Yeah, when I push, you push it further. Push, yeah. Push, yeah. You push alternately, it stays inside. Push, very good. Push. So you have to push it in directions that have not been filled up. So like this direction was empty. Some direction there is empty. And some up here will be empty, yeah. Very good. And some may be down here. Okay, that's enough. Take the suture. And here, right here in the center, one stitch. Close to the edge, yeah, here, yeah, very good. Go ahead, right in the center, little deeper. He's doing it through the microscope, which is very good. After that, we'll go naked eye. Now I'm showing you the tunica here, pick up the tunica. Well, but go into the correct point, yeah. Hold the tunica, yeah, correct, that's right. Yeah, hold it there. Make it, uh, don't let it evert. So your needle should come somewhere here at this point. Yeah, yeah, correct the angle. That's right. Yeah, over there. Yeah, just pick up the edge and out. Very nice. Top lights on, please. After this, we'll be removing the microscope. We'll use the surface camera. Pull it through. Yeah, watch out, there's no mosquito. Ah, sister, very good. Feed him. Yeah, that much length is perfect. And tie. So now you can see the testes is kind of reconstituted and it will be fairly easy to close the tunica with a continuous suture. So after this, I'll be removing the microscope. Mosquito, thank you. Scissors ready. Yeah, tighten the knot. Yeah, very good. Done. Tucked. Nice. Now we start the actual suturing Take. I'm moving the microscope out. Surface camera in, lights here, please. How long is the suture? Where's the suture gone? Mm -hmm. In a flint? Okay, so take that. Surface camera scene. So now we can start from the corner here, from the very corner. Yeah. Pick up the opposite end. And yeah. And then we will go continuous. So these three stitches, two things help closure. One is when you dissect, you should not shred the tissue. As you saw, it was very anatomically opened out. And two is if you place these interrupted sutures, it will approximate and recreate the tunica so that the subsequent closure becomes very easy. Now we'll continue. No cutting. Six knots. Yeah, because this is proline and it is fiber, so it will be very slippery. 
and it's continuous, so you must have enough knots. If it unravels, that would be a catastrophe. And now we'll just continue in a continuous suture, which will be a simple suture, not locking. So close to it, close to the previous and close to the edge. Yeah and avoid inversion. So I think after a short while, people can stop watching because now this is just a continuity, but some important points. When this is over, we will for 10 minutes maintain pressure on the testes while we do the other side or while we just wait. And that is important for achieving hemostasis. And secondly, I will give a cord block with sensor cane at the end. And that is very important in reducing the post-op pain. Otherwise, there's no special precaution. We'll be giving a tight compressive bandage, which he will keep for four to five days. And that prevents hematoma and also keeps him pain-free. Any other questions, queries from the audience? Just a syringe me, sensor can 0.5% in a 10 ml syringe and put a 26 gauge needle on it. So there's a question from the audience of uh, in repeat microteases, what are the chances of finding sperms and what are the indications? No, you've seen that we've done a completely thorough job here. So why would a repeat microtease in a testes which has now been damaged have a chance when the first time it didn't? Now, if somebody else has done the micro T say, and the patient comes to me, I tell them that if Vinit has done it and he's not found sperm, don't repeat it. But if someone else has done it whom I don't know, then I tell him maybe there is a 10% chance that we might find sperm that he may have missed. But if I've done a thorough job, then I don't believe that a repeat micro T say would help. If you want to give any hormones, etc., you should do it before the first micro T cell, not as an afterthought when the first one fails. Right. 10.5%. Uh, so you can see we are just going past, and it's very quick and easy to get a nice proper closure. And don't worry about the tissue elsewhere. Just focus on the part where you're closing because as you reconstruct the sac, the tissue can be tucked under that. Any other questions? Ideally, this patient should have had a genetic study before we took him up. The yield is not very high. That is why often people don't do it. But at least in India, it's not too expensive compared to abroad. So ideally, it should be done. And especially if somebody comes for a repeat microtase, before I take him up, I would definitely do a genetic study. And if that shows a major abnormality, that would go against doing the repeat. Do you do a therapeutic uh, trial 
NTZ in men with equivocal findings, physical findings. Uh, a therapeutic trial. See, this concept of therapeutic trial has to be defined. If you mean do it and then don't freeze those sperm, that I don't agree with. Every sperm is very precious. So my concept of therapeutic trial is that the wife is not stimulated, but the surgery is taken very seriously and any sperm that are found must be frozen. So that can certainly be done. Uh, so, Rupin, sir, there are certain questions again around, you know, preparing, stimulating the testes and all. If you would want yes, to uh, summarize something sure. about it, how would you want to prepare? So, for example, this patient wasn't probably prepared, in, uh, so to say, because he was just given nutraceuticals. Where do you prepare the, them and, uh, sir, uh, what is your agent of choice to, you know, prepare the testes for better outcomes for microtessa? I didn't quite hear the question. Are you asking about hormone therapy before micro -tessing? Yes, sir. So basically, what is your agent of choice for hormone therapy and where do you use it? Do you use it uh, routinely? Yeah. So if someone has a testosterone over 400 or 450, to my mind, that is a testis which is adequately stimulated by gonadotropins and therefore additional stimulation is not indicated. I start by looking at the testosterone. Now, if the testosterone is less than 300, particularly three to 400 is a gray zone. If it's less than 300, then I consider this man as hypogonadal. Now, is he hypogonadal because of severe testicular failure or is he potentially stimulatable and some hypogonadism may be compensated by additional stimulation. So then we look at his FSH, LH, and estradiol. If FSH, LH are in the normal range and testosterone is low, or FSH, LH are low, normal, and testosterone is low, then certainly I will try hormonal stimulation. Which one I'll tell you in a moment. If testosterone is low, but FSH, LH are more than one and a half times normal, to my mind, he has already been stimulated adequately, despite which the testes is not capable of responding. And then I don't give any hormonal therapy. Now, if I have to give hormonal therapy to raise FSH and LH, I often start with clomiphene because it's much simpler, easier, cheaper. But if someone argues that we want to give a gonadotropin trial, I won't argue against that, but I prefer to use clomiphene. Now, if a patient comes where FSH, LH are normal or high normal, but estradiol is significantly higher than testosterone, then rather than clomiphene, I will give letrozole or anestrozole, preferably anestrozole, one mg every alternate day, which will lower the estradiol, increase the testosterone intratesticular, and by lowering the estradiol, it will also raise the FSH LH. If I start with clomiphene, I will monitor FSH LH testosterone after a month and then take a decision whether to add something more based on that. Often I have seen that if I give somebody LH, for example, if FSH is above normal, but LH is normal and testosterone is low, I may give only LH. When I've done that, testosterone has gone up because of negative feedback. The FSH is then suppressed to below normal level. So if I give, if I have a patient with above normal FSH, low LH, low testosterone, I will give HCG plus fertomid. In one Japanese trial, they started with HCG, very high doses, 5,000 units thrice a week. And in a large proportion of the patients, later on they had to add FSH because they found that FSH got very suppressed by the high doses of HCG raising the testosterone. So you could use any of the hormonal modalities, but monitor the outcome and change your regimen 
if you have not got the desired outcome. And the desired outcome would be an FSHLH slightly above the normal range, testosterone over 400 or 450, maybe estradiol in the mid-normal range. That would be the therapeutic goal. And that we could give. Now, the time again depends. I said three months, but in the Japanese trial, they had given it for six months. And there are people who have claimed even one year of therapy, which can be sheer torture for the patient. Five injections a week, which are very, very expensive. So it's a very tricky issue for which there is still only very low quality data available. So now what we're doing is we're taking question answers for the next five minutes while we are maintaining pressure on the testes. For the local, I need a 26 gauge needle. Any other questions? 0.5. Sensor came? Uh, ah, perfect. Take a tuberculin syringe and connect that needle. Okay. So far, no sperm. That's no surprise. If it found sperm, it would have been a surprise. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, see if Hello. any questions are pending in the chat box. I think we've covered uh, all of them, ma'am. We've, uh, okay. we've seen questions covered. Okay, so now I'm giving the pod block, which will be at three levels. One is under the cremaster. Small quantities. Second is I'm feeling for the vase and injecting in the cord at the level of the vase. Again at multiple levels. And finally, I'm injecting under the skin. With all of these, you should wake up with no pain. As I was telling Vinit yesterday, we did a similar procedure purely under local, not even sedation. Block properly given can be highly effective. Thank you, sister. Now another three minutes of pressure. I think this pressure is very important to stop minor rosing. Mm, he's going to close. Uh, I don't need to see. So now we will close the tunica with 5.0 proline, and then we'll close the skin with Vicryl Rapid 5.0, and we'll give a tight elasto crepe bandage, which the patient will retain for five days. And antibiotics and painkillers orally for five days. And then we'll come back for an examination and counseling based on the histopath report. If there are no other questions, we can stop the transmission because now it's just a simple closure. So I think we have really enjoyed this uh, as usual. Uh, in a, a, it's a great to understand that even in a negative uh, outcome where we in fact have common or negative outcome we can enjoy a presentation so thoroughly thank you so much sir. thank you very much uh, dr jata uh, yes sir thank you thank you rupin shah sir for your uh, time and for your efforts and uh, your meticulous uh, presentation step by step and i think in the morning the penile prosthesis the efforts you took I, I, every time to prevent infection uh, need to be appreciated because once infections happen, then they are a big disaster. And I just right. recently uh, requested you uh, about one of my patients. Uh, I remember that very well. And uh, we also thank Dr. Chawla, sir, uh, for his arrangements and all the efforts he has taken. And I now hand over the mic to sir for the final thanks. Uh, um, yes, sir, please uh, go ahead. Uh, no, no, I just on behalf of my department, I want to convey thanks to 
president dr sanjay kulkarni and uh, dr lakshman prabhu for being a part of this uh, program and uh, to you for covering my uh, absence and uh, uh hosting the uh, show on my behalf and thanks to the moderator i think vanit and raman did a splendid job they keep uh, our operating faculty dr vipin shah engaged with all the questions and probably they make the whole subject complete so many thanks to them they spared their time they were busy and we gave a very short notice to them and they and they chipped in and uh, a lot of thanks to them um, uh, ot staff and my nscs staff so many thanks to them uh they were here since uh, last night arranging microscope arranging the things uh, and uh, i think they did a good job thanks to our videography team headed by me uh, for covering this uh, whole program and um, i think thanks to the in padmanaj is not here he is just uh, coming so he has come i think with this his closing remarks so will uh, sign off again with a lot of thanks to everybody who joined in and uh, thanks to dr rupisha uh, for coming here and in accepting our invite and to, i know he's very busy tomorrow he's going to mangalore for another day program um, yeah so probably he is uh, still not reached with this uh, dr sujata i i thanks and hand over to you uh, for signing up i just like to yeah. in here and give a very big thanks to dr arun chawla he has been pursuing andrology for many years even before it become fashionable he would keep on discussing on how we can have a workshop or a lecture or a session so i would call him a true friend of andrology and of course my dear friend and i thank him very much for organizing this session i thank sujata vinit raman for doing such a wonderful job sharing this it's always very reassuring when knowledgeable people are there to chair and ask questions and guide the audience and of course i've had wonderful assistance here from the people working with me so thanks to all of you all and to the nursing staff and to the audio visual who've done a very good job and yes sir thank all of you thank you okay yes, so now sir. the test is back and the last trick for putting the test is back is normally the way you open it there should be a pouch here if you can find the pouch it will go back right into the pouch in this case i think the pouch is missing so we'll have to hold it with two mosquitoes so we can end the meeting here and now we're just going to close it so can we take this out it's blocking my vision can yeah. we hold it in okay bye everyone bye thank you sir thank you very much and thank you to all the participants and the chairpersons have a nice day thanks and we sign off